uh, uh, the normal Lie bracket, the two bracket, so something with two inputs, um, and the higher algebras will have higher brackets with more inputs. And the claim is then that any uh, classical field theory can think of uh, can be encoded in that language. And the way it works, if you look at it, a couple of examples is, is kind of um, it's kind of trivial. So you quickly convince yourself that indeed this is always possible. Although coming from the Sean Simons viewpoint, it may sound a little surprising at first sight because we think normally that this particular formulation is something rather special for topological field theories. Okay, so let me get started and explain this. Um, so here's the definition of an L-infinity algebra or what's also called a strongly homotopy Lie algebra. Um, so you have a vector space as for a Lie algebra, which I call capital X. And we assume that this is a graded vector space. So that means it's a direct sum uh, of potentially an infinite series of vector spaces. So there's an integer grading here. And on this uh, vector space, you have uh, brackets, uh, multilinear and graded anti-symmetric uh, or symmetric, depending how you call it, uh, brackets. So this generalizes the um, the, the Lie case where you have a two bracket, something with two arguments. Here we have uh, potentially an infinite number of brackets with infinite number of inputs. And I will use both these notations with the square brackets and this notation with a map BN where the N indicates the number of arguments. So that's just a multilinear map that takes in N vectors from the vector space and it spits out uh, another vector of this vector space. So it's an element of the capital X. And the grading here is important because the result of this map uh, is given, uh, has a degree as well. So the, the vectors that you put in, let's say a homogeneous vector, so they have a fixed degree. They belong to some of these spaces here. And then the output of this uh, map is given by a vector whose total degree is the sum of the degrees of the input vectors minus one. So that's so usually summarized by saying that the intrinsic uh, uh, degree of the, all the BNs is minus one. So that's a, there's also a choice of convention here. This is a so-called B-picture convention, which I will try to use consistently in this talk. Okay, so that's the basic data. I should also say this, this N goes from one to infinity potentially. So there's also the one bracket, uh, which in this notation is just, um, it's just the differential. What was the, the Ram differential before? Maybe just be a general one bracket. Okay, now the important point is that these have to satisfy generalized Jacobi identities. And I will <coughs> write a, a few in, in the next slide, um, but there's a very efficient formulation in terms of a so-called co-derivation. Uh, this is this capital D here, which is a, a formal or not so formal sum of all the BIs uh, that has to square to zero. So, uh, at first, that doesn't seem to make much sense because here you're adding up a one bracket, a two bracket, a three bracket. So it seems like you're adding uh, apples and pears, um, but you can actually make sense of that by uh, having this act on a, on a, on a suitable uh, so-called uh, tensor algebra, which consists of um, all possible higher powers of vectors. So you can, on this uh, vector space, uh, each of the BIs acts in a well-defined way as a so-called co-derivation. And so this total map D has a well-defined action and then we demand that it squares to zero. That's the definition. Um, now I won't get into details of these co-derivations and co-algebras, et cetera, um, but it's not so difficult. And then you can just work out what, how these relations look like explicitly. And it's something like this. So, uh, as I said, there is the one bracket, uh, B1, uh, which I also denote by this partial symbol. So that's just the differential, and that squares to zero. So the D squared equals zero to lowest order just tells you that the, the one bracket, the differential squares to zero. And that's, of course, exactly what we expected from the uh, Lie example with the Durham differential. Now, for N equal two, it becomes a little more interesting, because now we have two objects. We have the two bracket, B2, uh, and we have the derivation. And this uh, D squared equals zero condition gives me a compatibility condition between the two bracket and the differential, uh, which is written here. So basically this tells you if the one bracket acts on the two bracket, uh, you can move it inside by a Leibniz rule uh, where you get a sign if you jump an odd object. 
So that is this relation. Uh, so normally you would bring these two terms on the right hand side and then it looks like uh, uh, the normal Leibniz rule, except there's an overall sign off. And this overall sign is an artifact of the convention of this, uh, what I called before the B picture convention, uh, which is however more convenient for other reasons. So that's the compatibility between differential and two bracket. Um, for n equals three, um, now we have an uh, interesting relationship with the three bracket. So this is now the first time potentially get something going beyond Li. So this relation now tells you that the two bracket uh, does not necessarily need to satisfy the Jacobi identity. So if it would satisfy the Jacobi identity, you would only have this uh, uh, first line. So this is the familiar nesting of two, bra two brackets uh, and three terms with appropriate signs. Uh, if that is zero, you have a Lie algebra, a graded Lie algebra, but it does not need to be zero if you have a three bracket and a differential. And then its failure to be zero is controlled precisely by this three bracket. Um, so Lie algebras are contained as special cases. So graded Lie algebras contained uh, if the differential is just zero and a whole higher brackets are zero. But you have a generalization of Lie algebras where the failure of the naive sort of the naively bracket to satisfy Jacobi is controlled by the higher brackets. And then uh, moving on from here, you have an infinite tower of higher brackets, for instance, at n equal four containing this combination. Um, and all these infinitely many relations are the generalized Jacobi identities of uh, uh, L infinity algebras and uh, enco are encoded in this uh, co derivation squaring to zero. So that's the basic definition of an L infinity algebra. It's a vector space uh, with maps BN uh, satisfying these generalized Jacobi identities. Now, what does that have to do with field theory? So the, uh, there's a general dictionary uh, that's very simple between L infinity algebras and field theories. So given an L infinity algebra, as I said before, you have a graded vector space. So you can think of it as a sequence of vector spaces uh, labeled by, by gradings. Uh, um, so here you have in space uh, uh, at degree zero, at degree one, at degree two, at degree minus one, et cetera, extending in all directions. And I'm using conventions here, uh, as I said before, where all the BN have intrinsic degree minus one. So that means in particular, the differential has intrinsic degree minus one, uh, which means that it lowers the degree of the space. So X1 goes to X2, goes to X minus one. Now, uh, the point is that the different vector spaces have a natural interpretation in field theory. So X zero, you can think of as the space of fields. So if you have a set of fields collectively noted by Psi here, uh, you, you can think of this as defining the vector space X zero. Um, the differential then maps to a vector space X minus one. And you can think of this space uh, as, this, as the space of equations of motion. So the space in which the object defining the equations of motion lives. And if you have gauge symmetries, uh, you have a space X1 of gauge parameters. Uh, and it's, this may extend in, in both directions indefinitely. So if you have, um, if you have so-called trivial gauge parameters, so gauge for gauge symmetries, then you can introduce a further space X2, um, et cetera, and, and, and also spaces for uh, Bianchi or Noethe identities, et cetera. Um, and then the dynamics is just encoded in, in these L infinity structures, uh, in, these bra uh, in these brackets. So here's the typical action, or the generic action, um, where you write the quadratic term uh, in terms of the differential. So the differential acting from x0 to x minus 1, from psi to the equations of motion, is just the object that defines the free field equation. So the, the free field equation following from the quadratic piece of the action. And then the higher brackets encode the uh, higher vertices or higher interactions. So the two bracket encodes the cubic term. Um, it's cubic because there's also the pairing uh, with a third field using the inner product. So that's an extra structure that the basic L infinity didn't have. And that's exactly analogous to the Sean Simons example. And similarly, if you have higher vertices, um, uh, like a quartic one, there must be a three bracket, et cetera, et cetera. So the field equations take this Mara-Katan form uh, exactly as for Sean Simons, um, except that you have now this potentially higher brackets. So if you have a case where you have only uh, cubic interactions, 
then it stops here and it's a, um, a special case that's also uh, known as um, differential graded Lie algebra. So Lie algebra because you only have a two bracket, but differential because you also have the differential acting on this in a consistent way. And similarly, the gauge symmetries can be written like this. So lambda, sorry, this is an inconsistency of notation here. Lambda belongs to the space X1, which are called Xi here. Um, and the, the free part, the leading part of the gauge transformation is just given by the differential. And then you have potentially higher order terms um, that um, are defined by the higher brackets. So if you think of Young-Mills theory, for instance, it actually stops here, um, but in, in more general theories, for instance, in, uh, in string field theory, have all these higher brackets. Um, and just as a, as a side remark, uh, note that the grading here is, is quite important so that we give a degree to these different spaces and distinguish uh, to in which the space fields live. Because in this way, uh, you, you may have a, end up with a bracket that is either uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric. Uh, here you see for fields, you need this actually to be so symmetric for this bracket not to be zero. And indeed, with the graded symmetry convention I gave for the BN maps with the grading, you can check uh, that, um, that this is symmetric, while for gauge parameters is anti-symmetric. And that's of course what you would expect because then this is the bracket that defines the gauge algebra. So from this, uh, in this very general abstract uh, form, you can actually check uh, that if you assume that these, all these in, um, higher order terms are defined in terms of L infinity brackets, that all the usual consistency conditions of field theory are obeyed, classical field theory. So if you, for instance, try to check that the field equations are gauge covariant, so you take this field equation, you vary with this uh, gauge variation, uh, you find that it works, and it works precisely because you have the Jacobi identity. So if you use the generalized Jacobi identity of L infinity algebras, uh, you can do the usual checks. You can to closure of the gauge transformations. Um, you can check invariance of the action of the field equations. Uh, for instance, uh, trivially to lowest order gauge invariance, it just comes back to the statement that the differential squares to zero. Um, and so in this sense, uh, if, you, if you ask the question, what is the very general uh, uh, structure that you, that you have when you have a consistent field theory, uh, the answer is an L infinity algebra, because if you make a schematic a structural ansatz of this form and you ask what kind of brackets are these, what kind of algebraic operations are these higher brackets encoding higher terms in, in, in the uh, field equations or gauge variations, the answer is precisely is an L infinity algebra. Okay, so that's the general dictionary. Now let me give you uh, an example, uh, an example that I will elaborate on uh, also in the second part, which is uh, the U1 Higgs model. So it's uh, not, it's the most conventional theory you, you, uh, you can think of in, in some sense. So any quantum field theory book discusses that example, of course. So this also to make the point that L infinity algebras are not something very exotic that you, that only makes any sense for very exotic theories like closed string field theory, rather any theory can, reasonable theory can think of uh, fits into that framework. So, um, so you have the U1 gauge field, A mu, you have a complex scalar phi, and you write this action where F mu is just the, the U1 field strength, uh, you have a covariant derivative on phi, and I assume that there's a Mexican hat type potential that you have spontaneous symmetry breaking with the usual Higgs effect. Now, in order to really apply this dictionary, uh, I, I need this, um, as you see here. So one thing that goes into, one assumption that goes into it, that you have a really well-defined perturbative scheme. So you have a quadratic piece, a cubic piece, a quartic piece, etc. Then you can identify an L infinity algebra. So depending on the theory, in particular, that's true for Einstein gravity, you may have to fix the background and then expand around it in order to have the structure, in order to be able to read off um, uh, what the L infinity brackets are. So here as well, uh, let's expand around the background. So I you take the usual parameterization of the complex scalar in terms of a, a, a radial um, uh, real number R and uh, angle var phi. And thanks to the Higgs potential, uh, this R gets a VEF, it gets a constant expectation value. So I expand R around this uh, uh, constant value V 
and I call the fluctuation rho. So rho is the Higgs field. I didn't want to call it H because I need the H for the homotopy map in a second. So rho is the Higgs field, and then I have the Goldstone var phi still. And if you expand the action, uh, you get a bunch of terms. The, I displayed here the quadratic terms, where here this is the kinetic term for the uh, gauge fields A mu, uh, where this operator is given here. So the P mu nu is, is just this uh, guy over here. It's just a familiar Maxwell-like uh, kinetic operator for uh, gauge vectors. And then you have this shift by V squared, which is the mass term for A. So as you would expect, the A's become massive. Um, and that's the kinetic operator. But then you have still, I kept the, um, uh, the Goldstone field var phi. You have these terms here. And you, of course, have the kinetic term for Higgs and the mass term. Uh, so mu is just a parameter that shows up in the potential. So you have like these two parameters, which you may call lambda and mu, and V is the uh, uh, combination of lambda and mu uh, appearing in the Higgs potential, and mu defines the Higgs mass. Okay, so let's rewrite this theory or reinterpret this as an L infinity algebra. Um, so we start with the chain complex. Um, so the general dictionary tells us that you have the space of fields, which is x0. So I denote the fields collectively here by calligraphic A. Uh, so calligraphic A has three components, the gauge vector, the, the gauge boson A mu, the Goldstone var phi, and the Higgs rho. Now I can, uh, of course, gauge fix this var phi to zero, but I want to keep it for, for a little while just to make the gauge invariance explicit. Lambda is just the U1 gauge parameter and it lives in the space X1. And then I have the space of uh, field equations, which I call calligraphic E here. And then in this case, I also have a space of Noether or Bianchi identities, which are consequence of the gauge invariance. But it doesn't continue further in, into this direction because just with U1, you don't have trivial uh, gauge symmetries. So gauge for gauge symmetries. Um, now, what are, what are the differentials? The partial one that acts from gauge parameters to gauge fields uh, defines the gauge transform, the linearized gauge transformation. So delta A is uh, partial one lambda. And the partial one lambda is given here. So for A mu, that's just the familiar gauge transformation. For var phi, that's just a shift. So that, that's what this means. And rho, the Higgs, is invariant. So that's why there's a zero here. Um, so var phi goes with a shift, uh, which means you can just set it, cage fix it to zero. But as I said, I want to keep it for, for a little while just to make the point that th these L infinity formulations work uh, very naturally. In fact, in the most applications are in the gauge redundant formulation. And similarly, the differential partial zero from, from the space of fields x zero to the space of field equations uh, is given here so that uh, uh, del zero a equals zero encodes the linearized field equations. And um, if you just look at the previous slide, you can read off what the linearized field equations are. And so this, the first entry is the field equation for a, the second entry is the field equation for var phi, and the last one is the field equation for the Higgs rho. So that's just the free part of the equation of motion gives the differential. And the differential squares to zero, uh, for instance, uh, del zero composed with del one. So going from x1 to x0 to x minus one gives you zero, which is just the statement of linearized gauge invariance. So of course, if you take, uh, if you specialize the fields to be pure gauge, so if you argument for, uh, for this differential here is a del one lambda, then this is just zero, which is just the statement of linearized gauge invariance. Um, now here, of course, uh, you also have cubic and in fact quartic couplings, which I didn't display here, but it's just, if you expand this out, you get those higher order couplings. And by the general dictionary, that means that you have two and three brackets. So the two bracket, for instance, looks like that. Uh, it's again, this uh, master field capital A, and, you, and I wrote it out for two fields of the same kind. And it looks like this, where mu prime is the gauge invariant combination. Uh, so that just simplifies the notation. And the, the two brackets are defined in such a way that if you work out the, the field equations for the Higgs model, uh, they can be written in this Mara-Katan form. 
um, where you have one term involving a three bracket. Um, and for this particular model, it stops here because you have only quartic terms and no higher. But for my general theories, this may, may continue. Uh, in fact, the, the prime example where this continues is my second example, which is Einstein gravity. So I don't want to uh, dwell on this for too long. Uh, the basic story is the same. Uh, in order to match with L infinity, you have to work in a perturbative framework. So uh, you have to imagine that you take the metric G mu nu and expand around the background, which might as well be the flat Minkowski background. And you have a fluctuation. This is now the, the fluctuation is the fundamental field. You can think of this living in a vector space X0. And there's the space of parameters X1, which is a vector here. So it's because that's the diffeomorphism parameter. And then you have a space of field equations, which you can think of like the Ricci tensor. And by the general dictionary, you can now discuss the various brackets that appear. Uh, what's new compared to the U1 case is, of course, that now you have a non-abelian uh, uh, gauge algebra. So the, there's a two bracket for two gauge parameters, which is just given by the diffeomorphism algebra uh, of the vector fields that generate the, the gauge symmetry. So this is, a, this is an honest Lie bracket. It's an honest Lie algebra, and that's we know is the gauge symmetry of general relativity. Um, but the full theory is, is still an L infinity algebra with higher brackets. So that is not... There's no conflict here between having a genuine uh, L infinity algebra encoding the full theory and some parts of it, like the gauge algebra, just being a normal Lie algebra. So that just means there are no higher brackets than two brackets involving gauge parameters, um, but there's still higher brackets involving uh, fields. So for instance, because we know if you expand general relativity, you, you get something non-polynomial that tells you that there will arbitrarily high uh, end brackets for the fields. And then you can also discuss what, what other brackets you have coming from the uh, gauge transformations on fields, etc. But it's just uh, basically all follows from the general dictionary. Okay, so these were uh, the examples. And so the general L infinity algebra uh, and their relation to classical field theories illustrated with two examples. Um, are there any questions so far on the first part? Well, if not, then let me come to the second part. Um, now we'll uh, introduce an algebraic notion uh, of called homotopy transfer and uh, explain its relation to physics uh, in, in the context of integrating out degrees of freedom uh, and hence in, uh, in effective field theory. Okay, so let's start on the mathematics side. Um, so homotopy transfer, um, which is uh, also sometimes called or closely related to what's called quasi-isomorphisms. So uh, as I explained, the basic structure on which an, on which an L infinity algebra is defined is a, is a chain complex, meaning a, a sequence of vector spaces with differentials mapping between them and squ squaring to zero. So let's now assume we have two of those, x and x bar. Um, and I want to think of x bar as a subspace of x. It doesn't literally need to be a subspace, but uh, just for concreteness, let's think of it that way. So we have a, a projection operator P that projects the, the space x to a smaller space, a subspace x bar. And I want to assume that that smaller space also uh, is a chain complex. So it carries a differential that is compatible with the differential up here. And now we can ask the following question. Uh, suppose the original space X is not just a chain complex, but carries an, an, a higher algebraic structure. So for instance, it could carry a Lie, a Lie bracket, a Lie algebra structure. And then the question is, um, under this projection from the bigger space to the smaller space, can the algebraic structure be transported to this smaller space X bar? So is there then also an algebraic structure on X bar? And obviously the answer is in general, no. So if you imagine you have a, a nice vector space with a Lie algebra structure, and then you just brutally truncate to a very small subspace, you would of course expect that all of this algebraic structure is ruined. It's usually only in special uh, situations where 
uh, wh where your truncation is such that that the, the bracket, let's say the Lie bracket of two um, vectors in the subspace is itself in the subspace, in which case you have a subalgebra, and then you do have an algebraic structure on the smaller space. But if you do some generally crazy uh, truncation, uh, you would expect that you lose all of that structure. Now, the, the one case we are familiar with is, is a genuine subalgebra. Um, but what is very interesting here, and I think really the true strength of this framework, is that here's a much more general notion of still uh, having an algebraic structure on the smaller space. Um, and that uh, takes place if the projection is what is called chain homotopic to the identity. I will explain in a second what that means. Um, but if you have that, then the algebraic structure on X gives you another algebraic structure on X bar, not exactly the same kind of algebraic structure, but what I call here an infinity version of that structure on X bar. So just in terms of the examples we had, think of X having a Lie algebra structure. If your projection has this property uh, of being uh, homotopic to the identity, um, then this will give rise to an algebraic structure on X bar which is not a strict Lie algebra, but rather an L infinity algebra. So let's now explain what these obscure words mean. So you have this projection from X and X bar, and uh, it's important to also, at least for notation, to have uh, a map going the other direction, which is called the inclusion from X, to X, bar, from X bar to X. And you want them to obey these two relations for this to be um, uh, fall into this category. So first, uh, if you think of P as a strict real projection and an inclusion as just the trivial map that views a vector of the subspace as a vector of the full space, uh, then the composition of P with the inclusion is just the identity. So that just means if I take a vector of the subspace, I view it as a vector of the bigger space. So that's the mapping with the inclusion. And then I project back. Of course, I get the same vector because I started out with something in the projected space. So that's why here you have the identity on X bar. However, if you go the other direction, you first project down and then you go back by the inclusion. Of course, in general, you lost something because you projected. So this you should not expect to be the identity. Uh, and so what, what, you, what you need in order for this uh, story to work is that this is not equal to the identity, but it's equal to the identity um, up to homotopy, as, as one says. And that means that the, the failure term can be written like this. In terms of the differential and the new map H, uh, which is the homotopy map, and which acts uh, sort of in the opposite direction of the differential. In my conventions, it, it has degree uh, plus one, so it acts, it maps Xi to Xi plus one. So in this chain here, while the differential goes from Xi to Xi minus one, the H goes back in the other direction. So if you have such a map H such that this relation holds, uh, then you can transport the algebraic structure. And in fact, the reason is, or one important fact here is that the so-called homo homologies are equivalent. So whenever you have a, a differential that squares to zero, you can define the notion of homology, which is a, a vector space given by the kernel of the differential modulo the image of the differential. So that means you consider the space of equivalence classes of vectors in X, that are closed under the differential. So that means you're looking at the kernel. Uh, so if you had not the equivalence class, but the vectors being closed, that's the kernel. But modding out the image of, um, uh, of the differential means that you consider the equivalence relation where any two vectors that differ by an, uh, a partial exact vector are considered equivalent. So that's the notion of homology. And if you think of the physics examples that we just had, that is a very no very natural or incorrect notion of equivalence that we use in physics. So if you have a, um, if you have two fields uh, being two, two vectors in the space of fields um, that are close, that means they are on shell, um, but and you want to consider them equivalent um, if they differ by a, an exact term, and that means they're equivalent up to gauge transformation. So the homology talks about things like uh, on shell, uh, fields, modular gauge transformations, which of course is what we always do in physics. Um, so if you have this map 
if the projection is such that, that this identity is obeyed, then you can actually check that the homologies stay the same. So the homology on X and X bar are actually the same. So as vector spaces, they may be very different. But once you go to the homology, which in, in a, as I just reviewed, has, a, has naturally encodes the physical information, um, then they're considered quasi-isomorphic. They're not isomorphic, of course, but this is the notion of quasi-isomorphism. And then you can make the statement that uh, an algebraic structure on X, like a Lie algebra, is transported to an infinity version of that algebra, like an L infinity algebra on X bar. So that's one way to motivate L infinity algebras, or ma more mathematically, to think about why you ever have such structures. So now let's explain how this works. In, in detail, and I'll do this for the example of a Lie bracket. Hello? Yes. Ah, oh, you can't hear me. Uh, can I just ask a question? Of course. The little H map. What does that have a physical interpretation? I mean, I understand um, the things. Yes, it, it, it does. So the simplest case is just a propagator, but I will I will illustrate this with a physical example in a second. So it depends on the context what precisely it is, but it has it, it plays very natural roles in the physics physics examples. Okay, um, so let me first finish this the the, the this uh, homotopy transfer theorem. Um, so let's do it for the example of a Lie algebra on X. Uh, given so you given a Lie algebra on X and a differential of course, so it's a differential graded Lie algebra. How do we define an L infinity algebra on X bar? So what we have to define is a two bracket on X bar. So how do we do that? Um, so just a reminder, X bar has already a differential, um, but now I want to claim that it also carries an L infinity structures, meaning two and three higher brackets potentially. And so I have to define them now. So let's take two vectors in X bar, the smaller space. How do I define the two bracket? Well. Uh, the obvious oper operation is this. I take the inclusion to make them vectors in the larger space. So this I call by X and Y without the bar. And then in the larger space, I can just take the Lie bracket of these two vectors, X and Y. That's an operation I have. But I need something that takes values in X bar. So I just project down again. So I act with the projector at the end. That's really the only thing you can write down. Uh, that is a natural operation. So that's the two bracket. Now, in general, in the normal way of thinking, as we learn about just Lie algebras and things like that, this is, of course, a, a horribly ill-defined operation because you have this brutal projection at the end. So because you just, you're just you in the bigger space, you just project down. Uh, in principle, you lose everything. So if, you, if your truncation happens to be such that, that if you take the bracket of two objects uh, in the subspace, and it lands again in the subspace, then of course you're good because then you have a subalgebra and then the projection effect is not needed because you're already in the subspace. That's just the case of a subalgebra. So that's what we're all familiar with. But here you do something very strange in some sense. You, 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 you're not assuming that you land in, this, in, in the same subspace. You land somewhere and then you just project whatever extra stuff you get, you just project it away. So in general, this is of course a very bad thing to do. Uh, and concretely, if you now try to see if this is a Lie bracket check, Jacobi, of course, it doesn't work because you have, if you nest two of these B2, you have this projector in the middle. So you can't use the Jacobi identity for the original bracket on X. So Jacobi is just seems completely lost. Um, but the nice thing is that with this particular setup we have here, you can actually fix this failure of Jacobi by defining a three bracket. And this looks like this. Uh, so here is where the homotopy map comes in. So the three bracket is defined uh, in this particular way. So you have the, the two bracket on X. Then you have to act with H. And you also have to do that for degree counting reasons because you have to um, be able to take then another bracket. So there's three natural terms like this. And then there's also the projector involved. And then the claim is with these relations I established here, Assuming these relations, you can then check uh, that this is actually uh, consistent, defines the right L infinity relation, which I can remind you of, uh, like this one here. So the, the failure of Jacobi is then fixed by the three bracket. So you have to work out the differential acting on the three bracket and see 
that that cancels the unwanted terms. And you can just do that. So here, if you act this with the differential, you can move it past the projector because that's what's called chain map. Then you can move it inside the bracket by the Leibniz rule on X. And then you have to work with the partial on H, but that's exactly what these relations allow you to do. So if you work it out, you see that this precisely works. And so the failure of the two bracket uh, to obey Jacobi uh, due to this generally quite brutal truncation uh, is exactly fixed in the setup by, um, by a three bracket. And then you have, you have correspondingly higher brackets and one can prove this to all orders uh, so you have indeed a full L infinity algebra on X bar. And um, so a, 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 I think a nice review of this is given in this paper we wrote last year. And I think the, the math, the right math reference uh, is, is this one. Um, now, the point I want to make uh, now, the rest of this, the second part, is that this operation uh, of, of going to a subspace and then defining an L infinity on the subspace is precisely the algebraic uh, implementation of, of what we do in field theory when we integrate out degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, so let me illustrate this with the example I had, which is the U1 Higgs model. Um, so the U1 Higgs model had the, the, um, the gauge boson and the Higgs, and of course also the Goldstone field. Um, so you can ask, can I integrate out these two or three fields? Um, well, you can, of course, in field theory. Um, what I will explain now is that this, the homotopy transfer does that for you. So let's discuss um, the first example. So suppose I want to integrate out the massive gauge boson. Um, and, okay, let me say more carefully, and together with the Goldstone field, which is anyhow uh, only pure gauge. Um, so that means I have now a projector on the subspace of fields that I want to keep. And this is just the, um, this is just the, um, uh, get the Higgs field row. So the full space is sort of this three component structure and the subspace has only one field row. And corresponding the inclusion map going the other direction just takes an, an object in the small space, a row, and makes it a, a vector with three components and just sets this to zero. So this then trivially obeys uh, that P iota equals to one, because if you start uh, with a row, you map to the bigger space and then you project back, you get again the row. So that's the identity on the small space. But the interesting thing is now what happens to the, if you go the other way, if you do IP, you first project and then you go back via the inclusion, you have to check that this is chain homotopic to one. So let's compute the difference of IP and one. Um, well, IP, um, uh, so P, of course, just kills A and phi. Um, so you get zero, but then you take minus one. So you get minus A mu minus phi. And on row, nothing happens. So if you take the difference there, you get a zero. So what we need to show is that this vector here, this, this operation here is, is, uh, uh, is equal to this combination here. This was the definition of homotopy. Uh, so I get something that is not zero. So IP is not equal to one. But this, what is non-zero must be writable in this form in order for this to work. So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to discuss every possible term here, but structurally you can see what's happening. Uh, so here I, I first act with H0. H0 means I map from the space of fields, uh, which is X0 to the space of gauge parameters. So it goes the other way than the differential, remember. The space of gauge parameters is just a single field or number here. So I have an H0 of A. And then I act with the differential, which was the differential of the uh, defining, defining the gauge uh, symmetry, which was given here. So d mu lambda and lambda. Um, so this, the action of the differential looks like this. And then I have the second term, where now I act with partial zero. That gives the field equation. And then I have an H minus one, one step further. So acting from the space of field equations back to the space of fields. So this I, I have to obey. And the claim is that this just works if you define the homotopy maps as follows. So you have two homotopy maps in this example. Um, you have H minus one from field equations to fields. 
And that just acts on the first component, the field equation for the A component, and it leaves the other two components, the field equation for rho and for phi, unchanged. Um, and as a reminder, this operator O was defined to be the kinetic operator of the uh, a massive gauge boson A. So it's given here with this P, this differential operator of Maxwell. So here we need the inverse of this um, in order to find the homotopy. And um, well, you can of course worry about whether this is a well-defined notion, whether it exists. One way to think about it is as a geometric series uh, that's an expansion of this operator I just wrote, and then it looks like this. So it has higher and higher orders in P, which is a differential operator. So in general, this is something that has, induces infinitely many derivatives. And of course, in general, when you integrate out stuff, you expect something. Uh, if you don't make extra assumption, you expect something non-local. So that's one homotopy map from equations to fields. And then you need one more because there are two terms here, which is from fields to parameters. And that just is the natural operation. You have these three components. You need a scalar out of it for the space of gauge parameters and you just pick out the Goldstone field, which makes sense because that's the object that shifts by the gauge symmetry. Okay. Uh, so the homot there's a homotopy relation. Um, so you can ask, what does the homotopy transfer give me? So we can work out the, the two bracket, as I explained before. Um, you, you do the inclusion uh, to go back to the bigger space. You do the two bracket, and then you project down. So if you, uh, if you remember what the bracket was, uh, which is given here, um, well, you can work it out. And um, since, well, it's, it's difficult to do it in your head, but uh, you can believe me that uh, only the row component survives. And uh, so if you project now down, you just get this term. So, so what if what you, uh, at the level of the action, what you essentially, essentially have done, you have set to zero a mu or a mu prime, which is this gauge invariant combination with bar phi. And you can check that the same is true for the three bracket, uh, in other words, for the quartic couplings. So, so homotopy transfer uh, for qu quote unquote integrating out A, uh, and this example just amounts to setting it to zero. Um, so that's not very exciting, but that's actually, if you think about it for a second, uh, that is the correct tree level effective action for integrating out A mu uh, or A mu prime. Um, which may be not immediately obvious here, but if you look at the Lagrangian, uh, you see uh, that the A field enters only quadratically. So it doesn't have any linear couplings, which first of all tells you that this is a consistent truncation to set it to zero. But second of all, at tree level, uh, that setting A to zero is exactly the correct way to integrate out A, because at the level of diagrams, you can convince yourself that if you only care about uh, external uh, states corresponding to the field that you keep, which is the Higgs row, there's no diagram you can, you can draw. So if you don't go to loop level, uh, if A enters quadratically, there's nothing you can draw that has A uh, internally. And so uh, for all processes you care about for the fields you keep, which is rho, uh, you can just set A to zero. Um, yes. 10 minutes, just okay. so you know. Thanks. Um, okay, so that's uh, not so exciting, but uh, at least the homotopy transfer here gives you the correct answer from a field theory point of view. Now, the second example is, is, is more interesting because something happens here. And this is now, if you ask the other question, suppose I want to integrate out the Higgs. So before I integrate out the, the gauge boson to get a theory for the effective theory for the Higgs alone, now I do the other way around, which maybe physically is also more interesting. I want to integrate out the Higgs field itself and um, the Higgs boson and to get an effective theory for the massive gauge boson A mu. So um, I've made sort of a big deal with keeping the var phi to have a formulation with gauge redundancy and just to show that everything can be formulated uh, precisely in that gauge redundant form. Uh, but of course, it's, it's also a little silly in this example because you can just gauge fix it to zero. So let's just get rid of it once and for all. And the point I want to make here is, is that this getting rid of var phi uh, can also be interpreted as homotopy transfer. For instance, you can think of it as, as a new projection and inclusion that acts as follows. So you have this bigger space 
And now you project down a, a smaller space that only consists of an, a vector and a scalar rho, a mu and rho, and define the projection in this way. And you have an uh, uh, inclusion that acts like this. So you just put a zero here. And this is actually a homotopy. Um, you can check that it satisfies the homotopy relation when you put as the homotopy map, just uh, h of a, just picking out the var phi. Then this homotopy relation is obeyed. And so you can go over um, from the bigger theory with the larger field space to a smaller one via this homotopy transfer. And this example, that's just the step of going from a gauge redundant formulation to a formulation in terms of gauge invariant objects, which is, has less degrees of freedom trivially because you have now eliminated the gauge symmetry. So you can think of it as a super fancy way of talking about gauge fixing or uh, as a fancy way to talk about writing things in terms of gauge, gauge invariant variables. Now here this uh, looks uh, probably a little silly because here that it's just the trivial Stuckelberg type gauge uh, symmetry. So I, I can imagine that most of you had strong urge for the last 50 minutes to immediately set it to zero. And, but okay, now it's set to zero, but <clears throat> in gravity actually uh, a similar application uh, works well in the context of cosmological perturbation theory. So there, um, the, the use of gauge invariant variable is somewhat popular, which was pioneered by Bardeen in the early 80s. And there's the classic review by Mukhanov et al. So to, in the free theory, they showed how to reorganize the field in cosmological perturbation theory in a gauge invariant way. And using a similar interpretation of homotopy transfer, we showed recently um, how this can be extended to all orders and fields. So you can think of building gauge invariant variables to all orders via by a homotopy transfer and using the, the corresponding what's called L infinity morphism. So that seems to me a, a cute new application for homotopy transfer, which is a much more sophisticated version of this simple effect here. Anyway, so this was just an intermission. Uh, long story short, we got rid of the var phi. So now we're down to a two term L infinity algebra because now there's a space of fields and field equations and the gauge parameters and Bianchi's are gone because I've eliminated the gauge redundancy. So I have now fields curly A, which have a vector and a scalar component. And the differential is now just given by this, which is the free, are the free equations for the fields that are left. The calligraphic D here is box uh, minus two mu. So it's a mass operator up to a sign for rho. Sorry, the kinetic operator for rho up to a sign. And then you can also write the two bracket and the three bracket, which is, looks basically like before. So I've given you only the two bracket. Okay. So well, that's now the, sorry? You have five minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, now I want to integrate out the Higgs boson. So I write on the homotopy for that. Uh, so I take um, the projection from A to rho goes to A because I want to integrate out rho. <clears throat> and then the inclusion just goes the other way. It's just A zero. And the claim is again, this set is the homotopy transfer for the homotopy map, which is given by this where again, I need a non-local operation, uh, the calligraphic D minus one, it's the inverse operator. Um, and so let's see what happens. So it's easy to check that the transport of two bracket is trivial. And, and that sort of follows immediately from the structure of this, um, uh, from the inclusion and the two bracket. So the, 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 remember the prescription was you take the inclusion of two arguments, you go to the bigger space and take the bracket there. The inclusion here maps a to a comma zero. So the, the, the row component is just zero. And if you look at the specific bracket here, you see you always have rows uh, here, here, and here. So those, they, you don't, they drop out immediately. You have one term, which is quadratic in A, um, but then this one is projected out because it wasn't the row component. So the projector just goes to A. So there's the transport of two bracket just vanishes. And that just means that integrating out a row doesn't give you new cu cubic couplings. Okay. Um, well, that's the result. And that's in fact what, what, what you would expect. Uh, so I'll explain in a second. Now let's do the same for the three bracket. Uh, here it's getting more complicated. So there was the general formula I, I told you before. You have this nested brackets with the homotopy map in the middle. So the first step here is again to do the two bracket of two A's via the inclusion map. And as we just saw, 
uh, from the two bracket here. This just gives the AA term in the row component. So you get something like this. But in this case, we are not projecting. This is not like the, the two bracket example here. Now we're acting with the homotopy map. The, the homotopy map just acts here with a D minus one. So that gives the next line, this term here. And then finally, we take the bracket of these two, uh, which if you use this formula here, you can quickly see looks like this. Uh, and this now shuffled things around. Now it's in the upper component. And now I can project to the upper component. And that just gives me a non-vanishing contribution. So that tells you that there's now a quartic term in the action, which is defined by the three bracket, which looks like this. So I have to contract this with another A because of the inner product here. And then you get this quartic interaction term. So integrating out the Higgs had the effect to this order that you have a new quartic interaction term. Um, now, most of you probably see that that's exactly what you would expect, but let me just walk you through in the last two minutes. Um, uh, the quick argument. So at tree level, again, everything I'm saying here is at tree level. This is exactly what you would expect. You start from the Higgs action, which is given here. Uh, you work out its equations of motion. And now you can solve it perturbatively in the number of A's. So to lowest order, you get rho equal, well, you have to bring the D to the other side, D minus one, A mu, A mu, plus higher order terms, which I ignore here. So at tree level, solving the equations of motion perturbatively and plugging back into the action is the correct procedure to integrate out that field. So if you plug this back into the action row, you get, you produce precisely the correct quartic interaction term that was also produced by homotopy transfer. So in that sense, homotopy transfer does exactly the same thing for you. Now, just as a side remark, this of course, it gives, is, you should think of as a generally non-Wilsonian effective action because we, we did not care about here whether the field we integrated out is much more massive than the one we keep or any conditions of that kind. And if you don't have conditions of that kind, uh, you get something non-local. Um, and that comes technically here from the fact that the homotopy map is non-local. But of course, you can always consider the special case uh, where you have the usual or should get the usual Wilsonian effective action. So for instance, in the limit of infinite Higgs mass, uh, this this calligraphic D uh, just up to a constant, um, uh, well, it just reduces to a constant. So this D minus one disappears and you get a term like this. So then that, that's just the usual local effective action with higher order interaction terms that are still local. Um, uh, the second point I want to make is that um, what is nice about this, this way of thinking, at least uh, for us, it seemed useful, is that in order to establish homotopy transfer, you only need the data of the free theory, which are encoded in the chain complex. So the, the homotopy relation, et cetera, that was just, that is just uh, established at the level of the data of the free theory, of the chain complex. But then the theorem guarantees you that there's a full-fledged L-infinity algebra. So that's what we use, re uh, used recently in this work with uh, Alex, uh, Chris Hall and Victor Lecoeur, Alex talked about in order to prove that there must be a weakly constrained double field theory. And we did that using just the free part of closed string field theory, because that has all the data and there you can just define, establish the existence of a homotopy map. Okay, so as anticipated, I'm already out of time. Uh, so the, here are just a couple of other papers on L-infinity algebras and field theory applications. I won't have time to say anything about that. And as expected, I have to skip the, the third part um, on duality covariant formulations. So let me just go to the conclusions. Um, so um, some of the points I made here is that um, uh, we, we can interpret uh, Wilsonian or non-Wilsonian uh, effective actions or consistent, also consistent truncations of string theory via homotopy transfer. So this, my interest in this, in fact, was started by a paper of Ashok Sen in 2016, uh, where he showed or where he discussed a normal field theory language, I mean, as normal as it can be in string field theory, uh, how to define sort of more exotic subsectors or truncations of string theory, one of which should be double field theory. And it turns out that this process of integrating out fields that you don't like has a very neat formulation in um, in, in uh, homotopy algebras via homotopy transfer. Now, what 
What I didn't discuss at all uh, is how to do this beyond the classical level, beyond tree level. So the, that's um, ongoing uh, work is how to find an algebraic formulation at the quantum level, or if you include one loop, two loop, etc. And here the framework is what's uh, sometimes called loop L infinity algebra. So you have to extend the notion of L infinity algebras, and that's directly related to, to uh, the BV formalism or quantum BV uh, in this case. Um, now there's, well, there's all kinds of other things uh, one can think about, like in the context of double field theory, re relaxing the section constraint uh, must be possible because we prove that the theory exists uh, and can a principle derive from string field theory, just in practice, we can't because string fields is too complicated. So, but in any case, this, this way of thinking of higher algebras um, could give us a, um, could give one a, a different handle on this problem and maybe uh, make progress on this. I have nothing concrete to say at this point. And then there's this whole other research uh, program, which I didn't have time to discuss on exceptional field theory and, and um, where you have these exceptional groups and the gauge structure is, uh, is, is encoded in much more non-trivial L infinity algebras, where also the gauge algebra by itself, which here was in the Yuan case, is just a billion, just trivial, and even the gravity is also a strict Lie algebra. But already these algebras are very, uh, 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 very much higher algebras, real L infinity algebras. And, and an open problem in this program is really, what is, is there like a huge, big algebraic structure that encodes all these uh, exceptional groups up to E8 or perhaps even E9 um, in one unifying structure and understanding what kind of higher algebras are around is, or what is certainly the first step in um, making progress on this, uh, on this open problem. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Olaf. We have a question from Ulf. Hello. Hello, Olaf. This is Ulf. Hello. Uh, I'm, thank you for a very nice talk. And um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is a very naive one. If in, in the chain complex, in um, x0, you replace the fields by super fields. Has that been discussed? I find it hard to see what an impotent operator would be in that case. Um, you, you mean if you have uh, super fields, if you, do you think of supersymmetry or, or just more generally if you have any? No, let's say super, supersymmetry. Yes. Uh, well, I haven't. I certainly haven't discussed it here. I also haven't really worked out an example like this ever. Um, but I don't see any problem of principle. This, of course, that means that the space X0 fields has a further, has more structure to it, that this itself has a decomposition, a grading into a subspace of bosonic and fermionic objects. Uh, so that's not a, a contradiction. Uh, so the, the basic structure I outline is, is what you always have, but in special cases, you can have more fields and yeah, okay. there can be more structure. So there's no obstacle to formulating no, uh, okay. super, super symmetric theories. It's just that then you bring in a, a yet another kind of grading, which, which is okay. But you need to define the important uh, differential, for example, and, and, uh, I'm yeah. sure it can be done. It's just difficult for me to see how it works. Well, it's just if you think in terms of components, um, let's let's not do super space immediately. Uh, so I understand. So, uh, so let's let's see where we have an example. Right. So here, literally, what you do is um, uh, you, you, the differential on the space of fields is just given by the linearized field equations. Um, so if you have fermions in the game, uh, whether this in a supersymmetric combination or not, you just have an extra entry here where you have the Dirac operator, let's say. Um, I mean, as I said, I haven't thought further about it, but I think that's really how, how it would go. And so you have a multiplet of bosonic and fermionic fields together, um, which of course is no problem for us if we do supersymmetry anyway, but even if you don't have supersymmetry, that just means there's a further 
the structure to that space, a further grading into uh, further decomposition into bosonic and fermionic subspaces. And the same is if you have gauge symmetries around, let's say you have supergravity, you have a gravitino uh, that comes with its own gauge symmetry. That just means the, the, the space of gauge parameters would have an extra entry. And this, this would come into this differential here in such a way that the near potency, uh, again, just reflects the linearized gauge variance. Okay, I guess I'm after a, a fully super super uh, covariant way of, of uh, defining everything, including the the differential. I'm sure. I mean, I I can see that it can be done at the uh, component level. But as a follow up up question, I I'm wondering about this uh, um, homotopy transfer. If you want to uh, integrate out auxiliary fields. Is that another example of a... Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So if you in, if you have uh, real auxiliary fields, so with, we're integrating them out as just algebraic, uh, then uh, then the, 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 you can exactly formulate it in terms of homotopy transfer with the simplifying feature that the homotopy map itself is, is then also just a local thing. Uh, so... Um, let's see where do we have an example. Uh, yeah, so then you have uh, so in that case you you would have a homotopy map that just looks like this, uh, where this where you don't have this to invert some differential operator. Uh, so this could just be the identity in that case. So uh, any example of integrating out real auxiliary fields um, is is an instance of homotopy transfer. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Maybe I can just ask a brief question. Um, so can you use this to learn something new about the U1 Higgs model, or is it really only useful when you're looking at complicated theories? I, I think for the U1 Higgs model, there's probably nothing new to be learned here. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I should say, uh, if you understand these examples in, uh, in enough detail, you see that you're really doing the same thing as you always do in field theory anyway. So I don't think you can make a case that you can really some, do something very different that you couldn't do already in, in normal field theory approaches. It just, this gives you an, a new way of thinking, uh, a new viewpoint uh, that I think, at least for me, it, it sort of clarifies uh, issues that arise in more, um, um, more difficult theories or theories which you can't just explicitly write down and just sort of look at the equations and do things explicitly. So the, the example of closed string field theory um, is a good one here because closed string field theory is so complicated that uh, I wouldn't even know how to really write out uh, a, a one of these higher brackets, but we are guaranteed by the authorities that these must really exist in the form of an L infinity algebra. So if you accept that, then you can prove that there must be a weakly constrained double field theory. Um, and that's a very reassuring conclusion. And all, all what you need for this is the data of the free theory. Um, no, so, so Sen made that point a few years ago, that paper I cited, but at least for me, it was always a little, um, wasn't so sure if, if, if sort of saying, well, you just integrate out what, whatever you don't like, whether this really in, in concrete detail means that you could write down the theory. Now with this homotopy transfer prescription, uh, I know how to explicitly write out these, the effective field theory and these brackets if you give me the full theory. So, so that at least um, helps to clarify your thinking, or at least my thinking in this case. So it's, it's just a different language to talk about things, but that a different viewpoint can always be useful. And that's, I think, the way you should think about this. Okay. Great, well then, um... Let's thank Olaf again. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, Olaf. We have uh, Chong Soon Chu next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. You have to allow me to share screen, okay. <clears throat> I think you should now be able to. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. 
First, uh, I would like to thank the organizer, uh, in particular, George and Dimitris, for invitation to this uh, workshop. Despite the fact that the world is still, uh, most of the world, I think, uh, is still uh, in trouble, if I'm allowed to say so, uh, it's really a privilege to be able to participate in, in a scientific activity and continue on to work on uh, interesting uh, things and discuss with you guys. So uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, uh, written here, a novel vacuum phenomena and boundary effects in string and field theory. So um, it's based on a series of work which I have stuck uh, with my uh, former postdoc, Rong Xin Mao and Wu Zhong Guo. Uh, both of them have now uh, become a faculty in back in China. And my current PhD student, Billy Learn. sorry, so uh, the, for, the, for, the, for the sake of uh, completeness, this is the list of reference. Uh, so I will uh, highlight some of the results in my talk uh, and try to tell a story. The story is uh, based on, this is the, uh, the title, uh, the outline. The story is based on uh, three things, vacuum, boundary, and mild anomaly. Uh, Vacuum is certainly very important uh, to physics. Um, it's the field uh, and relevance for a uh, lot of things. For example, in quantum field theory, uh, effect like Kaiser-May effect, uh, symmetry breaking, method stability, uh, confinement in uh, in, uh, in QCD. These are all a uh, consequence of uh, the field properties of vacuum. Uh, in string theory, of course, uh, uh, we know mirror symmetry, duality symmetry, landscape, and even swarm land are uh, hot topics of uh, research. So uh, understanding of the vacuum can also help us to uh, sometimes to select good theories. For example, this is the idea of uh, landscape and swarm land. Uh, vacuum, uh, strictly speaking, is not really uh, nothing. Vacuum is just a ground state of the theory, and it can have longitudinal dependence on various parameters of the theory. For example, the vacuum can be penetrated by some background field, or it can be confined by uh, by physical boundary. So uh, the presence of boundary can make uh, the vacuum even more interesting. So this is one of the main uh, the character uh, playing important role in my research uh, in the last few years boundary. And the connection between vacuum phenomena and boundary is uh, uh, well, normally play uh, quite a large role, a major role in this. So I will also discuss this. Um, let me uh, discuss a, a few uh, lawful phenomena. This lawful phenomena doesn't mean they're fundament, uh, fundamental in the sense that uh, 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 give you new physics. They can be just uh, phenomena which are uh, sit around in, in a theory which we all know about, but we, we didn't realize that they are there. But nevertheless, they can have a very important consequence on, on the rest of the, of the physical system. So for example, one of these uh, phenomena is, uh, is called a chiromagnetic effect or chirorotical effect. Um, so the chiromagnetic effect and chirorotical effect was discovered in the 80s. Uh, the, it's, uh, what happened was that uh, if you turn on a magnetic, magnetic, magnetic field in a material system with a uh, chiral anomaly, then uh, a current can be induced. These are electric current. Uh, it can be of vector nature or it can be of axial vector nature. So um, these are the chiral magnetic effect. And one can also rotate the stir the uh, system, make it ro rotate, and that can also induce a current. All of these are uh, because of the presence of chiral anomaly and the uh, uh, and and the presence of a non-zero non chemical potential. So one may wonder if this is possible to have uh, such kind of uh, anomalous uh, transport in vacuum where there's no uh, chemical potential, but anomaly still could can play a role. So this is uh, the first question uh, which uh, basically started the research a few years ago. So sorry, keep jumping. Okay. So uh, in uh, 
2018, we discovered a relation uh, between the uh, boundary wow anomaly. Wow anomaly is the is the anomaly describing the scaling, the violation of the scaling symmetry. So uh, if the system has a boundary, then the anomaly will consist of a bulk part and, and also a boundary part. Both of them have, have been classified uh, mathematically because of a West Minnow condition. So they satisfy consistency condition. So they can be classified and well uh, tabulated. Uh, but what is not known before is that uh, if you uh, change the background field which appear in this anomaly, they actually obey uh, this kind of uh, integrability condition. What I mean by integrability condition is that uh, the left hand side is a is a close or exact sorry exact uh, expression. Uh, so the anomaly uh, variation of the anomaly with respect to, for example, with respect to a U1 gauge field, uh, that is uh, given by the integral on the right hand side, and that is supposed uh, to be uh, exact. So that that's by no means clear that the right hand side this integral is, uh, has to be exact. But uh, if you do the integral and uh, extract the UE divergent term from this integral, then that term is, uh, is, is exact. So this is the content of this uh, relation. We call this inter interoperability condition. So by using this interoperability condition, we can relate uh, the, um, the near boundary behavior of, uh, of the electric current to the behavior of the wild anomaly uh, and, and then we find this, uh, we predicted that, uh, this relation. So uh, J equal to uh, E C square CH bar, and then perpendicular to the B field and the boundary uh, normal vector. So um, so this uh, current, uh, uh, the B1, sorry, the B1 here is the U1 beta function, which I measure how much the uh, scaling symmetry is violated. So this, uh, relation, this uh, current can be derived from from the way I just I just described uh, using the wild anomaly and in principle I I'm sure you can also derive it using uh, perturbative quantum field theory uh, but uh, it can also be described uh, derived sorry derived using uh, boundary uh, CFT uh, boundary holography ADSB CFT so this is the uh, the connection uh, of this talk uh, with uh, with the title of the workshop uh, progress in uh, quantum gravity and string theories. So I'm talking about quantum field theory here, but there's a connection uh, with uh, string theory. Uh, it will become clear later. Okay. So um, the next uh, phenomena is uh, Fermi condensate. So condensate refer to Fermi condensate refer to the uh, long zero expectation value of uh, fermion bilinear. Uh, there's a lot of well known phenomena. For example, the couple, couple pair in BCS theory of superconductivity or the chiral condensate of QCD, they are, they are uh, condensate. Non-trivially, uh, due to the uh, strongly coupled dynamics of the, of, uh, of the, of the system. <coughs> and because it's a, it's a, it's a non-trivial parameter depending on the strongly coupled dynamics, so it, it's also used uh, quite often to characterize the phases of the theory. So, uh, what we find that find is that uh, if we uh, turn on a, a hex field, so these are really like a st uh, st uh, standard model particle physics now. So we turn on hex field with a, a Yukawa coupling, uh, like uh, like this, and uh, we find that um, the condensate can become long, uh, again long, long two field near the boundary. And it depends on the gradient of the of the hex field, and also depends on the uh, on k. K is the extrinsic curvature of the boundary. So if you have a, uh, uh, for example, this can apply to cosmology. For example, if you look at a a star, for example, uh, with a with a with a boundary and with a curved boundary k, and uh, with some hex uh, hexing uh, inside the inside the star. Then it, it implied there could be a uh, some kind of a condensate behaving this way near the uh, boundary of the star. So I don't know whether this will be important as to physically or not, but there's a lot of application in principle. Uh, this phenomena uh, of uh, that I just described can be applied to because of the uh, wild anomaly is a really universal uh, uh, presence in uh, all kind of physical system. By the way, uh, when I say wild anomaly, I don't mean the theory has to be conformal to start with. 
the anomaly I'm referring to is uh, the quantum anomaly. So the system can be classically already uh, wildly uh, scaling symmetry, but then there's always a quantum part, quantum contribution to the violation of, uh, of the wild scaling symmetry. This is uh, what I call wild anomaly. So for example, uh, the uh, induced current I, I just uh, talked about can uh, actually uh, correct even in, uh, in QED uh, with a massive electron. Okay, again, there's an integrability condition, and this is the relation which uh, allow us to derive the content state uh, from the anomaly. Now, uh, there's another phenomena which is uh, interesting, a uh, vacuum phenomena, which is a uh, uh, generation of spin current in the presence of electromagnetic magnetic field. So we all know uh, quantum fluctuation of electrons or direct field carry energy and charges. Uh, the en energetic part or, uh, of the quantum fluctuation give rise to many interesting effects, for example, the Kaiseme effect or the Stringer effect. Uh, the charge, ex uh, charge aspect of the quantum fluctuation basically give rise to the induced electric current, which I talked about uh, earlier. Now, as if you follow this uh, thinking, then you may ask, since quantum fluctuation of the electrons also carry spin, degree of freedom, uh, uh, does it lead to any uh, interesting phenomena? Then, in fact, uh, we found that, uh, this is with my PhD student, uh, uh, in the presence of an electromagnetic field, the spin polarization of the vacuum, uh, the polarization of the vacuum can be spin polarized. The state of the vacuum can be spin polarized and resulting in uh, the presence of a spin current. So, uh, in this uh, notation here, J J i the two appendices. The first appendices is J refer to the spin uh, polarization. Uh, so it's the spin is a four vector. So this is the spatial component of the spin, and J zero refer to the uh, zero component of the spin. I refer to the velocity of the of the spin current. So we find that uh, the spin current, the renormalized spin current operator, depending on uh, depend on the uh, external EM field in this way. This is uh, by doing a one loop, uh, on as a one loop uh, renormalization and, uh, and, uh, and we normalize uh, the composite operator uh, carefully, uh, giving you this result. So the renormalization of the composite operator give uh, a interesting effect. Uh, if you look at this formula, the, uh, the de dependence on the fast structure constant is one of alpha. So it's a non perturbative in the uh, in the coupling, and this is uh, coming from the renormalization of the composite operator of the spin current operator. Uh, now this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, apart from the fact that it can invisible, it can be observed. So we also propose how it can be observed by putting a liquid crystal probe in the vacuum. Uh, apart from this, uh, this result uh, I show you actually also depends on uh, the UV compression, which uh, we assume here. Of course, QED is not a uh, UV complete, it a, has a lambda pole. So here we assume uh, a lambda pole. Uh, the lambda pole gives us uh, this theory. But suppose you, you want to embed the QED in a grand unified theory, for example, uh, then you have to replace one of alpha by, by something slightly different, which will depend on the uh, cutoff scale and the coupling of unification at the, uh, at the cutoff. So, uh, so in principle, if you if one do the experiment, one can um, not just but, but one can not just uh, confirm this phenomena, but one can also probe the kind of physics uh, uh, at high energy. So at the moment, this is unknown. What's the uh, UV theory? So this is again, then this can be think of as a way to connect to quantum gravity or maybe string theory if the string scale becomes uh, so 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 uh, low. Okay. So this is uh, my uh, first part, and then I come to now to the holography, which is more stringy. So uh, in principle, uh, every quantum field theory uh, can be uh, construct from as a duo of a of a graphic of a uh, gravity. This is this this is a holography. Actually, maybe I'm, I'm saying something too strong, but anyway, there's a duo to uh, gravity, which is given by quantum field theory. And in, if the uh, field theory uh, or the uh, quantum field theory has a boundary, then uh, 
the question is uh, what is the the, the holographic duo to this? So this is a, a question which uh, we can ask. Of course, this is conceptually uh, could be very uh, difficult uh, because okay, uh, if Tanakayaki in two, uh, 2011 he proposed that if M is uh, M is the, uh, the 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 space of the field theory, conformal field theory, and he proposed that that's a that's a cap a cap like or bullet like uh, space time uh, in the ADS space, which uh, a portion of that space time denoted by n with a boundary q will be due to uh, to my uh, boundary from homo field theory. So p is the boundary of m and n is the part of space in the box which is due to m. So this picture is uh, is nice, but uh, conceptually you 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 can you can certainly argue that uh, is uh, it is it's, uh, it's difficult to extend beyond the classical level because uh, Q, I mean, all this here, we're talking about classical geometry. So if we want to uh, talk about quantum gravity in, in, in this uh, space N, and we should allow not just uh, the effective, for example, let's say we just look at a, uh, not even without the string, con uh, uh, string, string G correction, just as gravity uh, correction, uh, you include high derivative theory of gravity in N, but if that is not uh, probably not enough because Q should also you should also allow Q the surface Q to fluctuate, and this is uh, not clear how we can we can do this. Right. So anyway, suppose we just do a classical uh, large N, and uh, classical gravity is enough, then this picture is still uh, valid. So the question then is uh, how to uh, determine the surface Q. Uh, then it's not very difficult. I mean, you start with the standard. Uh, ADS CFT uh, uh, dictionary. So you have the bulk action with a cosmological constant, two, two gamma, uh, two lambda, sorry, two lambda. And then uh, because uh, uh, you have a boundary, M is the, the boundary uh, in, M is the boundary in the bottom and Q is another boundary Q, which is a new boundary in the, in the bulk, a bulk boundary. So you have uh, to include two Gibbon Hawking's boundary term. So these two K term. Then, uh, then Tanagaki proposed also, uh, you can also include like a mass term on Q. Q is like a, like a brain, so you can call it end of the world brain. And this brain has a tension, T. So uh, T uh, can be shown, uh, this is what Tadashi showed, uh, to measure the boundary degree of freedom of, uh, of the boundary field theory, uh, boundary conformal field theory in, in, in the form of a G function. Um, apart from that, uh, because of the presence of a junction, this uh, Q intersect M longitudinally at P. This is the place where the normal vector actually is not continuous, it's the junction. So um, uh, you, you have to include a, a term which takes care of the junction. Uh, and theta is some angle at the, at the junction. Anyway, so uh, then uh, you can take this uh, action and then vary uh, with respect to the boundary metric. And you get the, uh, if you focus on the boundary term, then you have some bulk, uh, equation of motion term, and then this is a boundary term, uh, then you get this. So the action principle will have, will, will, will tell you that you have to select the boundary condition so that uh, this uh, uh, boundary variation is uh, zero. So there, then there are uh, three possibility. The first possibility is what Tadashi uh, uh, Tanakayaki uh, obtained in 2011. Is he took a Neumann boundary condition, so basically all this has to uh, go to zero. So he got like an Einstein equation uh, for the extrinsic curvature. And <clears throat> uh, a few years ago, we looked at that problem and then we realized that uh, there could be another form of a uh, boundary condition. For example, we can take a, a conformal boundary condition. So we fix the class of uh, as a conformal class of the metric at the bound on Q. So uh, then, then if you substitute this uh, there, there, then you see that uh, there's a trace actually contracted, and so you get a trace condition. So instead of uh, the whole matrix uh, Einstein equation, now you get the trace part of the Einstein equation. And of course, you can also take a delta x equal to zero, that you then you don't get uh, any constraint on 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 Q on the surface. Okay. Now they all define consistent ADS uh, BCFT. Um, but out of this uh, three, I, uh, 
the CPC is in fact uh, most interesting. Uh, actually, it's, it's a point which uh, we didn't realize uh, back then in 2017. At that time, we thought uh, C, uh, this uh, CPC uh, we have is uh, the correct one, and there's some uh, seem to be seem to be some uh, problem with the other other one. But now we 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 think all of them are correct. But still, the CPC is uh, probably the most interesting one because of a, uh, a follow up work. Uh, Whitten in 2018, uh, he he actually he, he it's not something new in his uh, paper. He also uh, said that uh, he there's a, a lot of uh, work in the uh, math literature already talk uh, about how one do uh, perturbation of uh, uh, gravity uh, metric perturbation. Uh, for different boundary condition imposed on the theory. So in particular, uh, written in, in his uh, paper summarized uh, the, the fact that uh, direct clear boundary condition uh, is usually problematic. Uh, the CBC on the other hand, conformal boundary condition is elliptic. Elliptic means uh, it leads to a sensible perturbation theory uh, uh, for, the, for the metric perturbation. It doesn't mean you have a, a quantum gravity. It just mean uh, mathematically. If you look at uh, the uh, second order perturbation, you have a, a operator. The operator is elliptic, so you have a your mass gap and you have a well defined spectrum. That at least so is is uh, something necessary in order to uh, really discuss about uh, maybe quantum gravity. But uh, for for DBC, for example, for Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, usually, uh, there's a uh, continuous uh, spectrum of zero mode. And that make uh, the conversation, or at least the discussion of perturbation, uh, uh, very uh, complicated and confusing, physically. So um, it's interesting. The CBC is uh, elliptic, and it means uh, if you study the metric fluctuation on on Q on this uh, end of the world brain, uh, that's a well-defined perturbation series. So now we can study ADS BCFT, including uh, this fluctuation. So this is something new which has never been looked at before. Usually, when we study ADS CFT, we all look at a uh, buck, buck uh, gravity, and then maybe even include a buck uh, uh, fluctuation correction the, the effect. But the buck gravity on the boundary, this is something uh, which has not been considered before. So uh, this is something currently uh, I'm working on with my collaborator with Wong Xing. Okay, so let me talk about the application. So with the formulation of ADS uh, BCFT, uh, one thing come to mind is to uh, it's a famous work of, uh, oh, I didn't put it here, uh, Skanderis and Henningsen about the holographic wild anomaly. Uh, so we can we can try to reproduce the holographic uh, boundary wild anomaly from the ads cft So this is a, a very similar in idea, in fact, quite straightforward. So we start from the regularized uh, uh, action, including the covariant bound, bound, uh, kernel terms. So these two are the covariant kernel term for four dimension uh, BCFT. Um, so because of the presence of this Rm, this uh, which is scalar term, so you need to also to introduce uh, a uh, given Hawking's boundary term on, on the P boundary. So uh, with this, with this guy, then you can work out the um, the Brown York uh, energy momentum momentum tensor, which I don't write here. Uh, then you divide that, you take the trace. That's uh, the trace anomaly. And uh, then this is the result. So what you have to compute is uh, to to find out how theta, this uh, angle of Q intersecting P, and the uh, extrinsic, extrinsic curvature, uh, the scalar part of the the trace of the extrinsic curvature, how they depend on on uh, on the on on on, this, on on Z, and then we write that in terms of the well-known quantity. Uh, so this is the result. We did this exercise for three dimension and two uh, four dimension. So uh, this thing here come out uh, giving you exactly what you expect from uh, normal uh, quantum field theory classification. Uh, so you have you got a couple of uh, uh, boundary central charge in front. In three dimension, we call them C1, C2. In four dimension, we get a B1, B2. This uh, A is a, a central charge of the of the uh, of the buck anomaly. Uh, the other class is not uh, invariant with the presence of boundary, so you've got a bit contribution. From the other class here, so uh, this is a, this, a strong support of the AD, ADSB CFT proposal uh, with uh, CBC. 
in the same way as uh, Scandarius and Henningsen work. Okay, of course, you can also uh, try to reproduce the uh, induced uh, electric current near the uh, boundary from the ADS uh, BCFT. So this is uh, what you need to do is uh, you have a current at the boundary theory you want to uh, look at. So you, you have a U1 gauge in the box. So all these are pretty straightforward standard. Then you impose uh, uh, some boundary condition for to solve for the equation of motion uh, for A, and you get the configuration, then you get, in the end, you do get uh, up to constant. I mean, up to constant, then you do get the exact form of the uh, of the current. Uh, this is a B field, um, normal to the uh, perpendicular to the normal, and this is the uh, geodesic distance from the boundary. And you can also derive the condensate, of course, uh, holographically. Now, then you, uh, there's a bit of application uh, you can do uh, in, uh uh in string theory i mean the 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 result i just talked about is uh, for four dimension standard so you obtain it already anyway from uh field theory so it's nice that you can we can confirm this uh all these all those results in uh in holography uh in a way to to justify the ADSB cft uh but there's something new you can also con, con uh, obtain in six dimension uh so in sixth dimension, the uh, trace anomaly is, uh, is known. I mean, actually, in any even dimension, the form of trace anomaly is known. There's a Euler, Euler class A type anomaly, and then there's also a bunch of uh, conformal invariant which can contribute to the trace anomaly. Uh, and you have this uh, B, this uh, copy type and, uh, anomaly, and this is the bug, and you can also generalize this to get the boundary contribution to the trace anomaly. So uh, the the the, the, the thing which is uh, not uh, known, which uh, people haven't, uh, I think, looked at before is, uh, what about if you turn on the background gauge view? So uh, in four dimension, we know uh, you have a similar expression for trace anomaly to a traditional contribution, but you can also turn on the uh, Yamu's uh, gauge view and just give you F square, the time theta function. That's what uh, Alice and, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and I forgot who, yeah. No, so, uh, in sixth dimension, uh, the, uh, the gauge view, uh, you have, of course, you can have still have Yamu gauge view, but that's not conformal. Uh, the gauge, uh, the conformal gauge view is a two form gauge potential, where, so it's the actual new, new lamp, uh, thing here. So, um, we would like to know what, uh, the form of the gauge, uh, view, uh, contribution to the wild anomaly. So one can follow the same idea as in, in four dimension. So we first derive the, uh the induced current so in, in sixth dimension uh the the natural degree of freedom is uh, not particle but string so the string coupled to the two form gauge field so in, instead of a uh, one form current you have a two form current jab so uh this is uh what you can get the b1 is a coefficient which uh uh, uh de will depend on the uh, background original background uh we consider so uh, taking that uh, as an input, and then we can also, one can also establish a uh, integrability condition between the wild anomaly and the work done by the uh, string gauge string uh, current. And you can integrate this uh, back, or, or I mean, you try to solve this equation, assuming uh, we know already the form of J, which uh, we, should, we derive by using holography, then uh, you obtain this. This is a prediction uh, of uh, of the uh, wire anomaly from the co uh, contribution of uh, gauge field. So B1 is still unknown. So we can apply, try to apply this uh, for, for example, for the six dimensional uh, uh, conformal field theory, living on N M fibrin. So this is a, a system which uh, has been uh, still, I think, very interesting, uh, but still very mysterious. Uh, so this, uh, uh, CFT is due to uh, graph uh, M theory on ADS4 times S7. So you, you substitute back the, the radius and Newton constant, et cetera, then you find that this coefficient B1, in fact, is just uh, scaling with N in the large N as N cubed. So that means the, the U1 current is, uh, take this form with, with N cubed. You asked me to interrupt you at one minute, so this is the oh, one minute. Sorry. 
Oh, one minute. Okay. So uh, normally this uh, current, this induced current, uh, if you go back to four dimension, is is obtained from uh, from the one loop effect. Uh, uh, now we don't know how to do it in in the uh, two comma zero theory, but assuming that it still come uh, has a direct relation with the degree of freedom, which is uh, circulating in the in the inter interacting theory, it would suggest that. Uh, uh, there, there is indeed n cubed degree of freedom in the two comma zero theory, which is uh, something which uh, people have uh, suspect for a long time with uh, evidence from entropy computation, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, last slide. In fact, um, not much of conclusion. I just, I just I've just tell you a story uh, about uh, quantum field theory and holography. I think they interact very well uh, as they should be, and uh, some of these uh, new effect. Uh, observable and could have consequences uh, on other system of interest and they're normally uh, universal and there are probably still uh, a lot of other implication which uh, hasn't been considered. And finally, I hope you, if you are lucky and you are in Kofu, enjoy your stay and I hope to be able to interact with you uh, physically soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have questions here? Maybe I can start. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you didn't discuss supersymmetry at all, which is uh, obviously a huge issue of contention at the moment, whether ADS makes sense or ADS-CFT beyond supersymmetry. Are any of your boundary conditions, are all your boundary conditions compatible with supersymmetry or are some of them incompatible? Uh yeah, I mean, uh, here we are just talk, uh, talking about the bosonic part of the theory. If you have a, if you have a complete theory with, uh, depending on the symmetry, supersymmetry, you can write it down, then you have the corresponding uh, uh, condition for the fermion, and they should be uh, a partner or a transformation of the uh, boundary condition, which I write down here, by super, under supersymmetry. So it can be completed supersymmetrically, but uh, we didn't do it here. Um, let's see if there's other questions in the room. Um, maybe online. Do you see something online? Okay, well then, um, we'll thank you once again for the nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and we have first coffee break of the day. First of many.
Welcome back to the second session this morning. Uh, we're starting off with Chris Hull, who's going to tell us about uh, non-geometry and duality. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm delighted to be back at a, at a live conference again um, with the lockdown you realize how much is lost by the um by the um opportunity to get together with um other physicists and so on um so i'd like to thank the organizers for um organizing um a conference despite the difficulties in organizing something in the present circumstances um on a sadder note i'd like to de dedicate my talk to theodore tamaris the great greek physicist who unfortunately died very recently so uh, I'm going to be talking about some work I did with um, my student, um, Nepal Chamjamras. Um, and um, so I, I'm just going to give it, so in half an hour, I'm just going to give an introduction to what's quite a lot of material in these papers, um, but to give a flavor of some of the things we're trying to do. So the starting point is um, the realization that dualities um, when you do enough dualities on enough circles, it relates the familiar brains to some strange exotic brains which arise uh, formerly in low co-dimension. Um, for example, um, uh, um, for co-dimension two, um, you um, get versions of seven brains with U-duality monodromy or U-folds. Um, I'll be interested today in the case of co-dimension one, which are sort of domain wall type uh, brains, which arise from duals of the D8 brain. Um, and one of the issues I want to address is that the isolated, isolated exotic brains are not consistent configurations. Um, and what I want to look for is trying to find um, ways of uh, finding consistent string configurations in which um, such brains arise in, in a consistent way. So since I'm going to be looking at duals of D8 brains, um, I start off by reminding myself, reminding, uh, remembering that D8 brains can be in, um, incorporated into string theory, provided you also have some O8 or interfold planes. Uh, they're necessary to cancel the charges. And I'll, do, I'll be looking at trying to look at dualizing this system of D8 brains and orientifold planes um, to get consistent configurations for the duals of the D8s. So it's a simple idea, um, but it turns out that there are many surprises which arise from uh, following this process through. And a lot of the things you might have naively expected from just following the duality picture through turn out to be uh, much more interesting and subtle. So my starting point will be um, the familiar um, duality, duality chain of um, of backgrounds, the starting one starting point would be to take a three torus with a quantized eight, uh, B field flux, where H is M times the volume, and um, then um, if you T dualize on one of the circles, you get a manifold which is known as a. You turn off the B field, but turn on a twist in the geometry, so you get a manifold known as um, a nil fold, which is a circle bundle over T two which has got a first churn class um, represented by this, where M, the integer, becomes the degree of the nil fold. A further T-duality takes you to a non-geometric background, a, um, a T-fold, which has got T-duality monodromy, and a further duality after that takes you to um, something which can't be realized in, ge in conventional geometry, but requires double geometry. And all of these can be fitted, have a very elegant um, picture in terms of double geometry. Um, 
as I showed with um, Ron Reed Edwards. So one of the issues with this is that none of these backgrounds I just described are solutions of string theory. Is the microphone working properly? It's, okay. um, however, we can find bundle solutions in which these arise as fibers, and then we can look at the duality acting fiber-wise on these, um, in these cases. And the simplest case is to take the case where these three-dimensional geometries I'd, on the last slide are fibered over a line. And one of the starting points that realize initial points that makes you realize that this is interesting is the realization that the null fold fibered over a line gives a four dimensional manifold, which turns out to be hypercalar and hence supersymmetric. So if we look at uh, the D8 brains, if we, for example, compactify a D8 brain on a circle and uh, T dualize in that, we get a D7 brain, but one which is smeared over the circle so that it's still essentially a domain wall. Um, and further T dualities will give smeared uh, D brains of um, lower, um, you know, D, uh, further T dualities will give D7, D6, D5, and so on, but all smeared over directions to get essentially a domain wall or multi domain walls. Um, and the null fold and its T duals fiber over a line to give um, solutions which are related to smeared brains. So, for example, the three. The, um, the three torus with H flux is a, um, gives rise to a smeared NS5 brain, the nil fold to a Klutz Klein monopole, and the others to exotic brains. So that's a, the link between the exotic brains and the solutions of the last slide. Um, and I'll, I'll spell this out in a little more detail in a moment. Um, the singular solution, however, these are all singular solutions as far as supergravity solutions go. So that um, one needs to go further to seek consistent string backgrounds. Um, for the D8 brain, one adds O8 planes, and these are incorporated in a consistent um, formulation, which is the, called the type one prime string theory. I'll remind you what that is in a moment. And my, the idea is to dualize this to find consistent solutions for the smeared brains. And um, this involves um, the orientifold planes being dualized to give some exotic new structure, which um, is something which is a little surprising. It isn't what you'd naively expect from dual, from um, um, what you would expect, what you might naively expect from uh, simply dualizing the supergravity solutions. And also um, the fact that Kaluza Klein monopoles arise, um, the same chain of dualities which gives rise to the, for, to the, takes you from the type one prime to give rise to, so to get, to take you from the D8 brain to give the Kaluza Klein monopole also takes the type one prime string theory to 2A compactified on K3. So this suggests, so because in each of these cases, um, so this suggests that there should be a picture of, in, in which there's the construction of K3 in which it looks, in which it looks like it's made out of Knutza Klein monopoles, uh, which is a little surprising and we'll be seeing um, how this works out in a moment. So the type one string, so just a quick reminder, the type one string theory is uh, the theory of open and closed strings, which arises from an orientifold of 2B string theory. And it has um, 16 D9 brains, which give the Chan Payton factors to the open strings and one O9 orientifold plane, or both of which spill the whole, fill the whole of 10 dimensional space. And the D9 brains have got charge plus one, and, the, and these are canceled by the orientifold charge. Um, so, so, so each of these D9 brains also has a mirror image. And so some people would say 32, but uh, I'm counting, I'm not counting the mirror images in this counting. Then a compactification on a circle gives, um, compactification on a circle and then T dualizing on that circle gives the type one prime theory which could be seen as a quotient of the 2A theory on a circle, which gives, which the circle becomes an orbifold. And S1 identified over Z2 can be regarded as giving a line interval. You're identifying one half of the circle with the other. And there's an O8 plane introduced at each end. And um, so we have a picture where there are 16 D8 brains um, moving along this line interval and an O8 plane at each end. And the chart and this, this, the setup is such that the charges all cancel here. These have got, each of these has char charge minus eight. 
cancelling the, um, the charge, uh, the sixth charge of plus 16 from the 16 D8 frames. So, um, so to get to the story with the Gibbons, with the um, Kaluza Klein monopole, um, start with, uh, there's um, a key role is played by the Gibbons Hawking metric, um, where V, given in this, the four dimensional Euclidean space, which is where V is the harmonic function on the R3 with parameterized by tau X and Z. And um, typically we would take a delta set of delta function sources um, of this way. And the string solution given by taking a product of this with uh, this hypercalar space with uh, six dimensional Minkowski space is what is often called a Kaluza Klein monopole. At each of these centers, Ri, you, is, uh, you say that there's a Kaluza Klein monopole located at that point. Um, so um, I mentioned the word smearing. What I mean by that is if you take this harmonic function on R3 to be independent of one or more coordinates, we say it's smeared over those coordinates. And the ones it's independent of, we can then take to be periodic. Typically, this gives rise to a singular metric. Um, so I'll be interested in the case where we take it in V independent of X and Z. It's a harmonic function, so it's just a linear function. Or more generally, we can take piecewise linear ones. So there's a discontinuity in the um, gradient here. And this is singular at the kink, which arises at tau equals zero. And we usually say that this, think of this as saying that there's a domain wall uh, on the two plane dividing the four dimensional space into two parts here. And the charge or the strength of this domain wall is given by the jump in the gradient M minus M primed. And this is, is seen to be the uh, energy density or tension of the domain wall. So if we look at this um, Gibbons Hawking metric at a fixed tau, um, then uh, it gives rise to a nilfold, precisely the nilfold geometry. And so we can think of this as this four dimensional space as a nilfold um, fibered over the line parameterized by tau. And we can um, take X, Y, and Z to be um, compact coordinates in this case. And the domain walls correspond to jumps in the degree of M. And then um, we can then take a string solution giving a smeared Kaluza Klein monopole. To generalize this, um, we get the T3 fibered over a line. We get this um, geometry. Um, so we get flat four dimensional space and the V can be either, uh, can have be piecewise linear like this. We get a dilaton as well and a B field. And uh, the 10 dimensional solution looks like this. And this could be interpreted as a Nova Schwartz five brain geometry smeared over the coordinates X, Y, and Z. Um, and we can then identify these to give a transverse space R cross T3 instead of R4. We can generalize this to multi-domain walls by having a piecewise linear function with discontinuities at these points tau i and a charge given by the jump in the gradient at each case. And we can also introduce a single-sided domain wall. So for example, if we have this potential, we can quotient by the reflection tau to minus tau to give something which only exists for positive tau. And that's sometimes um, referred to as a single-sided domain wall. Um, however, these are not quite consistent string backgrounds. So although um, we get hypercalar spaces, for example, in the geometric case of duals and uh, giving rise to a conformal field theory array from the walls, um, and similarly the duals give um, good conformal field theories, the domain walls remain singular, and also the linear deleton and the and V blow up um, with a linear V unless you end with single-sided walls. And we also need negative brains in this story to give zero net charge. So um, how do we think about what to do with this? So um, we talked about this chain of dualities um, relating these, um, the, uh, the sphere uh, K includes Klein monopole to the Nova Schwartz five brain. We can relate that to a D five brain and then T dualized to a D eight brain. And the same chain of dualities takes an ill-fold fibered over a line um, to a D8 brain uh, domain wall. So we can then reverse this. We can look at the, um, the, the consistent D8 brain backgrounds and then uh, work backwards. 
and get um, and seek to get consistent string backgrounds for the others. So for the type one prime string theory, we'd have 16 D8 brains of charge one and um, orientifold planes at minus eight of charge minus eight at the endpoints of the align interval where tau is naught and pi. And so you have these 16 um, D8 brains introduced and the total charge is 16. Um, or we could um, move some of the um, D8 brains onto uh, on top of one D orientifold plane and the rest on top of, and some on top of the other. So we get two charges at the either, either end, which are less than eight, um, but still the whole thing has to add up to charge cancellation. So now we look at the dualization. Dualizing the supergravity solution on T3 um, will give smeared Gibbons, uh, um, Kluge's fly monopole and Nova Schwartz five brains with the same V on the potential, on the interval. Um, there'll be 16 sources uh, and um, we look at the chain of dualities we're going through um, to get the, the set of, um, um, starting off from the D8 brain, we T dualize to a D5 brain and then a Nova Schwartz 5 brain and then a Kluge's Klein monopole and then a T fold brain. Um, and then um, there's a question about what happens uh, for the corresponding orientifold planes. The Nova Schwartz 5 brain, um, the corresponding plane is known in the literature as an ON plane. But there's a question about what happens here, which I'll come back to. Um, so we'll look at um, the, to understand this, we'll look at the full string uh, theory and its dualities. So um, the type one string on a circle is T dual to the type one primed on, on this, on the line interval. Um, and then we, I'll look at further compactifying this on a T3. And then the chain of dualities here um, gives rise to, um, a ch as could be, gives, could be also gives rise to um, a chain of dualities acting, um, starting off from the type one string theory, which is an orientifold of 2B. In each case, we get an identification of 2B or 2A in various ways. And the chain of dualities, which takes us to a Klutz Klein monopole, then takes us here to something which is the orbifold, uh, which is T4, 2A on T4 mod Z2, where the Z2 is given by um, this reflections in um, all, six, all four of the circles. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, so here we go. Um, and so this is one way of realizing the duality between type one on T4 with um, type 2A on K3. And um, we've seen that the brains give rise to um, gravitational solitons, the um, Kluge's Klein monopoles. But then there's a question about if we follow this chain of dualities, where do the orientifolds over here go to here? What are the orientifolds in K3? So, um, so we're looking at dualizing a supergravity solution with D8 brains to one with Klutz Klein monopoles. We get a space which is a nil fold fibered over a line with smeared Klutz Klein monopoles. And at the ends of the line, there should be some sort of geometric dual to the orientifold planes. Um, so, this chain of dualities predicts there should be a region of K3 moduli space where it looks like the dual of the type 1 prime string. So, it should look roughly like a line interval with um, a set of uh, 16 Klutz Klein monopoles um, 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 introduced along there. So it's an interesting to see that the, the spell check has corrected um, uh, manifold, um, the sort of, sorry, null fold to bill fold, which is, uh, I hadn't noticed, so sorry about that. Um, and the ends of this um, interval should um, look like the duals of the 08 planes. So remarkably, um, very recently in the mathematics literature, just such a region, uh, such, a, such a degenerate limit of K3 has been found by these mathematicians. So it's a family of K3 metrics with a long neck region, 
Each segment of the neck is a nilfold fibered over a line with jumps between the degrees of these in different segments. And these jumps are associated with the insertion of a gravitational instant on a Kaluza-Klein monopole. And the ends of the neck, neck are consistent, interestingly capped by spaces known as Tianyao spaces, which are complete um, non-compact hypercalar manifolds with the rice asymptotics to be asymptotic to a nilfold fold fibered over a line. And so they're just right to be glued onto this construction. Um, so the first approximation is the supergravity solution we've been talking about with these domain walls. And the mathematicians resolve these singularities. They resolve the singularities at the domain walls at these points tau i um, with an Aguri buffer construction. And they remove the single-sided domain walls, which are also singular with, by gluing in Tian Yao spaces. So what does this mean? So we want, so the Guri buffer construction is constructing a Gibbons-Hawking metric on R cross, with a transverse space, which is R cross T2 instead of R3. Um, so the first approximation is just the smear over T2 as we've done, but um, a better, what they do is they take a periodic array of sources in the XZ plane, um, take an infinite sum over these, regularize, and they get end up with a, um, a a well-defined regular solution, which is regular on a finite interval on the transverse R. So in this way, they resolve, this gives a, resol a, a neat resolution of these um, singularities in the middle. And these Tian Yao spaces, as I mentioned, are um, non-compact hypercada spaces. Just like Calabial spaces, there's an existence theorem, uh, but we don't have an explicit construction of the metric but they're a very interesting set of spaces. They're constructed from del pezzo surfaces and their classification follows the classification of del pezzo surfaces. Um, all we need to know from that is that, the, that these are asymptotic to a Gibbons Hawking metric on nilfold cross R um, for some, where the, B, the nilfold is of some degree and that degree is only allowed to be in the integers from naught to nine. Um, and um, so, um, and so these can be glued onto um, this uh, construction of, of um, nilfolds um, fibered over lines. Um, and yeah, and um, so from this, so from this first supergravity uh, solution. They resolve the singularities by gluing together Aguri buffer spaces and Tian Yao spaces to get a metric which is a complete K3 metric. So, some very hard analysis to show that there's a hypercalar manifold which constructed from this. And then they um, look at the, um, the, 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 the Tian Yao spaces at either end have got degree B minus and B plus. Um, these are related to the um, charges we were talking about before. Um, and um, these are canceled by the degrees of the, um, um, of the Kaluza-Klein monopoles. And in the end, we see that the, because the Kaluza-Klein monopoles, because the Tian Yao spaces have got charges um, up to um, between naught and nine, we see that the total charges of the Kaluza-Klein monopoles um, have to be less than or equal to 18. So we get these nice formulae here, which are almost the same as we got in the type one prime picture, but one change is that we've got an 18 instead of a 16. So there's an interesting discrepancy here. So it's almost an exact fit. So what's going on here? So it turns out that um, there's a very interesting resolution of this. So this picture of the type one prime theory in terms of two O8 planes and 16 D8 planes is the correct prescription for the perturbative type one prime theory as was shown long ago by Polchinski and Witten. Um, however, at strong coupling, the theory is it's something rather remarkable can happen. An O8 plane can emit one further D8 brain to leave something which is known as an O8 star plane of charge minus nine. So really, non-perturbatively, we should be thinking of it as two O8, O8 star planes and 18 D8 brains. And that's exactly what's needed to agree with the numbers which came from the K3 picture. Both cases have got 18 sources. And so this is what's needed for allowing 
And that's exactly what's needed for allowing, for example, SU18 gauge theory arising when you have coincident sources. So um, the important thing was that because we had some S duality in the chain of dualities we were looking at, um, so that meant that we we're necessarily talking about things at strong coupling. And so it's perhaps not surprising that such a story is emerging. How much time do I have? Okay. So um, I'll say a couple of brief comments about further, ge further generalizations. Um, so K3, of course, has famously got no isometries. So away from the orbital points, no conventional T duals can be taken. However, if we move to the region of moduli space with the long neck and this uh, interesting metric, in the neck region, it's approximately the nil fold times an interval. And we can then take a T dual of this to get, for example, a T fold times an interval or um, uh, an essentially doubled space times an interval. And all of this picture can be put in, and as I mentioned, the, these duals can all be written nicely in terms of double geometry. And this whole picture can be written nicely in terms of the double um, six dimensional geometry, doubling the nil fold um, to a six dimensional nil manifold and fibering this six dimensional manifold over a line. And there's a nice double geometry picture of this whole story. Um, and then this gives a double formulation of this whole picture I've just been talking about. And um, the sources now become exotic brains moving in a non-geometric background. And uh, I don't really have time to go into that, but uh, if you're interested, it's, um, we discuss a lot about that in the papers. Another interesting generalization, generalization, which is um, very interesting mathematically, is the Holst K3 story has an interesting generalization to um, uh, special holonomy manifolds, where we replace the three-dimensional manifold with nil manifold with a higher dimensional nil manifold, which can be thought of as a quotient of a higher dimensional nilpotent Lie group by a discrete subgroup. In the nilfold case, the, the, the group Lie group is the Heisenberg group. And these are higher dimensional versions of this. These can all be thought of as torus bundles over tori, or, or, or bundles, torus bundles over torus bundles over torus bundles, and so on. And um, remarkably, um, there are special holonomy metrics on the ma these manifolds fibered over a line, as was discovered um, from a supergravity analysis um, some time ago by Gibbons, Lou, Pope, and Stell. And um, we looked at the T dualizing this and T dualizing this, for example, interestingly, these special holonomy metrics gives rise to interest intersecting and nervous Schwartz five brain metrics. And then further dualizations will um, give rise to um, pictures of these different duals of these different uh, special holonomy manifolds in terms of um, other intersecting brains in turn, including um, some of these exotic brains. So it's a whole um, zoo of um, interesting um, um, geometries, dual to interest, and each of them has chains of duals, which include uh, which include intersecting brain solutions. So let me conclude. Um, the nil fold and its duals give rise to local string solutions by fibering over an interval, um, dualizing. Um, the type one prime enabled us to find full string theory solutions, at least um, in the context of um, the Nova Schwartz five brain and the Klutz Klein monopole. And in the Klutz Klein monopole case, it was realized as K3, it led to a realization of K3 as this nil fold fibered over an interval with Klutz Klein monopole insertions and Tian Miao end caps. And um, it's interesting that it's something which the this construction is something which was could have been predicted by the physics, but by the physics, um, but um, in the end, it was we were beaten to uh, to it by the mathematicians. And what's very interesting is it gives a good approximate geometry for K three that allows explicit duality transformations and explicitly relating it to various brain constructions, some of which I've talked about today. So. In each case, it's important that to, to understand how the singularities of the smeared brains in the supergravity solution are resolved. 
And um, it's interesting that the Tianyao space is giving, uh, giving a geometric dual of the orientifolds, which um, reveals some of the non-perturbative structure, and in particular, the OH star picture and so on. And um, there's still a lot of work to do to understand fully what the non-geometric duals of these are and how this structure arises. But it's encouraging that this procedure seems to uh, has worked in the cases that we've looked at and um, has led to something which has been rather intriguing and surprising, the, um, the um, interesting non-perturbative structure and interesting geometric structure. And um, the hope is that the generalization to special holonomy manifolds and intersecting brains will lead to um, further understanding and um, also some Interestingly, some explicit constructions of explicit metrics, which um, might be interesting. In particular, there's a question about whether, um, for example, the same kind of story which led the math which led to building um, K3 out of kaluz klein monopoles could lead to a way of constructing um, higher dimensional special holonomy manifolds out of um, uh, out of um, other out of um, intersecting includes quite monopoles or intersections of those with other brains. Um, so I'll, I think that's a good point to stop seeing as I'm out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. Do we have questions in the room? Yes. Thanks for a nice, uh, very nice talk. Uh, one, I have two questions. I don't know if there's time, but let me start with the first question. Yeah. Um, is there anything further you can learn about the heterotic theory via s duality between uh, type two and K three and? Uh, um, yeah. Yes, I mean, I think all all of these stories. I mean, we we have a good picture about what happens for the perturbative heterotic string, but if you're looking what happens to it non perturbatively then that's then the, the SO32 heterotic string is the same as the type one string. And so the stories I've been talking about, about the type one string at strong coupling could equally, I, I could have, I could have framed the talk in terms of the heterotic SO32, because I'm looking non perturbatively and I'm looking at these constructions. And so it's an interesting question about what would happen with the E8 cross E8 heterotic string. And interestingly, that um, would then talk not to this construction, but to the Harava Witten's construction. And I think that would also be an interesting avenue to pursue, but I haven't done that. And then maybe quick other question. It was not, did you get actually for exotic brains some uh, explicit string solutions? Yeah, so we've got the local solutions, which you get from, you get from um, so I, I didn't, I, I suppressed some of the formulae, but sort of um, you, the taking the T dual of the nil fold gives a, an explicit T fold geometry. And then as a generalization of that, where that's fibered over a line. So we get the local solutions. And there were, there's a question about how you resolve the discontinuities when you get a jump in the nil fold in the, in the charge of the exotic brains. And that would be related to a question about some, um, I mean, there's a question about what it means to have singularities in the double geometry. And there's interesting questions. And so a whole, a whole set of things one could say about that, whether you allow singularities in the double geometry so long as they project to non-singular things in the real geometry. Or to put it another way, if you've got a geometry whose T dual is singular, even if it's not singular, does that mean that it shouldn't be allowed or not? So there's a lot which one can, it leads to a lot of very interesting discussions, which um, maybe we can have over coffee. Or, Thanks, John. But, um, Any any other questions? Um, I think there's also no online questions, so maybe we move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank 
Okay, uh, so next up we have uh, Peter Schupp, who will tell us about graded geometry and gravity. Uh, like all the other speakers, I'd like to thank for the organizers, in particular George, but also Fanasis, working so hard bringing us here so that we can interact and discuss in person. Finally, it would also be nice to see John soon, soon again, somewhere here. Hello. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about graded geometry and gravity, uh, graded geometry approach to formulating effective um, string actions, gravity actions, and I'm going to take an approach. Uh, that uses deformations. If I can find the pointer. Okay, this is joint work with my former PhD student Eugenia Boffo, who has now moved on to Charles University Prague. Uh, please see these two papers for a long list of references, including references to, I guess, almost all the people which are in the audience. <laughs> almost. In the talk itself, I will be a bit sloppy with reference, so I apologize for that. All right, let me start with Niels um, Cube of the theories of physics. I have to apologize that I'm hiding your favorite corner here. <laughs> it's somewhere in the back. Uh, what I want to point out here is, uh, well, that's um, all of physics, I guess. And on the left-hand side, there are theories that we describe by geometry, while on the right-hand side, the appropriate tool is uh, algebra, so operator algebra and, st and stuff like this. So on the top, you have a pick. Do you want to generalize geometry or you want to use some um, um, Algebras, I'm going to take a compromise in this talk. So we're going to use graded geometry with graded Poisson algebras, which imply generalized geometry structures. Okay, since we're going to talk quite a bit about generalized geometry, let me like quickly flash some slides at you. We had this in these talks before, so it can be brief. So the idea is to incorporate further symmetries beyond different morphisms, and also to have unified description of a metric and uh, Fluxes, for instance, G and B can be incorporated in this generalized metric. There are several variants here. Uh, generalized complex geometry unifies symplectic complex in Riemannian geometry, the underlying structure is that of a current algebraoid. So I will need that later. So let me just very briefly tell you what is in it. You have a vector bundle, you have an anchor map from that vector bundle to the tension bundle, you have a, a bracket which we usually take to be the Dorfman bracket. You have a pairing and you have a set of axioms which can be written very compactly as here. So three axioms, that's some compatibility of a bracket with the pairing and with the anchor map. And then there's um, this uh, Jacobi identity, which is only valid in, in the second slot, not in the first one. And the bracket is not uh, anti-symmetric. A typical example is to take a generalized tension bundle, which is essentially uh, doubled, so you have vector fields and forms. Uh, closely related but not identical, uh, double field theory, exceptional field theory that we heard about in this conference. They also feature a generalized metric, uh, but they double the underlying um, space, by including also uh, the binding modes. And when eventually you have to take uh, section constraints to go back to the right number uh, of, of dimensions. What I really like about this approach are these really super elegant ways of writing down an, an action. What you see here is the first term in the generalized Ricci, Ricci scalar. But then in the end, like I said, you need to impose these constraints. So I'm not going to do it uh, that way, but rather along the lines of more traditional generalized geometry. So without doubling the space, um, it's, just, it's just as powerful as the other one, but it's a bit more tricky to write down actions. Or effective actions. But it has been done by many people here in the room. These actions, it's a bit tricky to have um, tensorial quantities. It can be fixed, but there's some playing around. And in my approach, I want to show how it goes almost canonically. All right, so in my talk, it will feature um, great geometry approach to generalized uh, geometry using the derived brackets. And I will also use something like a deformation approach to, inter, uh, to introduce into interactions. That's a quick outline. So I'll start to uh, explain what I mean by this interaction via deformation and how we're going to use it. Um, it's pretty well known how to do it in gauge free. I want to show you how to do it in general relativity. General relativity you will need to do this in a graded setting. Then I will move on to a setting that we can use to um, to get low energy effective uh, gravity actions. 
and uh, generalized differential geometry. And time permitting, I will tell you some other applications of the same methods. All right, so what's this idea about interaction via deformation? Well, gravity is very elegant. We can just think of gravitational force, forces as being a free fall, but in a curved space time. And it would be great to extend this idea also to the other forces. But a priori, it's not obvious at all how to do it. But clearly, if it's free fall, then we should maybe start with a free Hamiltonian and then introduce the interaction by a deformation of uh, the symplectic structure of a Poisson structures or in quantum mechanics of the canonical commutation relations. That's, of course, very closely related to using uh, covariant momenta, but it's not identical, I would say. Ordinary gauge theories when recovered via Moser's lemma. We had deformation maps that map your phase space variables to ones with a deformed algebra, and these maps are generated by uh, gauge fields. The maps are not unique, and you get the gauge symmetries back. So, so it's related, but it's not identical. Uh, this deformation approach is arguably a bit more a general. For instance, it allows magnetic sources, and it works very nicely in the graded setting. All right, just a um, simple example, well known, electromagnetic interactions and the coupling to a gauge field. So you start with a free Hamiltonian. And then you would usually deform the Hamiltonian by just replacing the momentum by the covariant momentum. So that's the traditional approach. Instead, what you could do is deform the symplectic structure and hence the Poisson brackets by adding in um, the gauge potential. And in terms of actions, it can be seen as follows. What I've written down here is the relativistic particle in the Einbein formalism. I'm coupling to a gauge field here, and then almost by reflex, everybody would now compute the canonical momentum to the Chandra transformation and end up with a deformed Hamiltonian. But maybe you should stop that reflex and just leave this gauge field sitting alone here. When you don't have the second term, you just have a kinematic for physical momentum, and you end up getting a deformed um, symplectic potential in front. From a deformed symplectic uh, potential, you get a deformed symplectic two form, it's written here, features the gauge fields. You get deformed Poisson brackets. And what gets deformed is the Poisson bracket of a momentum. The momentum that would be typically zero, but here features the electromagnetic tensor. And write down the Jacobi identity. And um, well, as long as you don't have magnetic sources, it would be uh, satisfied, but it will be violated if you have magnetic sources, but still the mechanics will continue to work, at least some of it. Equations of motion, the canonical equations of motion are just the usual ones that you would get in the usual approach. Of course, they have to be. All right, so let's try to uh, apply this whole idea to a gravitational setting. A gravitational setting before, let me flash back again, before we had deformed momenta by putting here the electromagnetic tensor, which is anti-symmetric. Now I would like to introduce a metric, which is symmetric. And the way to do it is to extend the phase space by in introducing odd variables theta. You may think of them as being differentials, like one forms, if you want. Um, so this bracket here on the left-hand side is symmetric. If you exchange theta mu and, uh, with two thetas, you pick up a minus sign from a Poisson bracket, you pick up another minus sign from these things being odd. But the other relations are undeformed. And now the beauty of this approach starts just by deforming this, everything else will be fixed by associativity. You don't need to think at all anymore. And by the grading, like here's the bracket of a momentum with theta. In order to preserve degrees, momentum uh, will have to be of degree two, and the result must be linear and theta. What you end up here is introducing a connection. If we look um, at P acting on a pair of theta, so it would be the connection acting on a metric, then the Jacobi identity will ensure that the metric is actually, uh, that the connection is compatible with the metric. The commutator of momenta will give you uh, the curvature tensor. So everything is, it's just like a machine. Just deform up here, everything else comes out automatically. Now, of course, you have a Poisson structure, you have canonical transformations, um, yeah, or infinitesimal canonical transformations that generated. Uh, by generators, and these generators can have degrees, various degrees now. Degree two generators are degree preserving. They will uh, preserve a degree of a Poisson bracket, and they feature diffeomorphisms and local 
Lorentz transformations. We've also generated the three, three one. We'll give you a Clifford edge of one that we saw on the previous page, uh, previous slide. Generators of degree three and finally generators of degree four, which are quadratic in the degree two momenta or a cubic in the fetus and the P or quartic in the fetus. Now here's something interesting happens. Uh, most general generator would have arbitrary coefficients G, gamma and R. But if these things are what the letters usually mean to you, then they're close into supersymmetry algebra for generators of degree three. So it's kind of intriguing. It's another way of introducing the connection and the curvature here. Uh, using the Hamiltonian, writing down the canonical equations of motion, you get the geodesic equation. And using the other ingredients, as you can write down uh, gravity actions. Okay, I said you can go back to uh, gauge theory or, well, also general relativity, I suppose, using Moses Lemma. Uh, Moses Lemma tells you how to interpolate between close by symplectic structures. Let's say you have a given symplectic two form omega. And you introduce a whole family of uh, symplectic two forms parameterized by t going from zero to one by adding a little piece to it. But the whole thing should be closed. So f should be closed and locally exact. Uh, Moser has shown that the map from omega to all these omega t's uh, is done by a flow that is generated by so called Moser vector field. We don't need to see the details here, but the proof is like just one line. It's really quite simple. There are graded versions of this, which still continues to work in a graded setting. The proof is identical. And there are quantum versions of this uh, in the star product formalism. And there are Poisson versions of this that we used a long time ago in a work on non-commutative uh, gauge theory. Okay, let me give you some examples of that use of the Mosa lemma and of deformations. Uh, that's our initial example. We deform the canonical symplectic two form by adding in the field strength uh, tensor. Well, df is obviously zero, locally f is equal to dA. And you can read of a Moser vector field, it's written here. So it features the gauge potential and the derivative with respect to a momenta. You compute the flow and it will change the phase space coordinates by replacing p by, by p plus a of x. So it will mix p and x. Uh, the PP commutator gives you the field strength. Well, I've shown you all that before. Uh, there's a freedom in this map. It will not change when you change A by uh, D lambda. So transformation of a map gives you a canonical transformation. That's how the symmetries come in. You can also write down non-abelian versions of this by introducing further um, generators or odd variables. Now, here's another example more interesting for gravity. It's a deformation of a symplectic two form by a spin connection. Um, okay, that's the uh, canonical symplectic two form. We introduce odd variables theta a here and uh, Minkowski metric eta a b. You can think of the theta a's as being just field binds. The deformation is done by adding uh, the exterior derivative of a spin connection to the symplectic uh, two form. So it's a canonical thing to do here. Um, spin connection is anti-symmetric in the AB, so it can be expanded in the theta A's. It's a degree two object here. Uh, here you see the Moser vector field, and you see also the transformation that you get. Uh, momentum gets replaced by momentum plus the spin connection. And degree-wise, that's correct. Momentum P was a degree two object, and so is the spin connection. You write down the resulting deformed Poisson brackets. We will feature the spin connection, we will feature the curvature tensor. And interestingly, and as expected, you also have a gauge transformation here that leaves the whole thing invariant. So that's a perfect setting for Einstein and Cartan. Gravity, and I guess if you tweak it a little bit, it should also be a nice setting for Newton Cartan gravity, but we have not tried it. Um, if you want to deform by a channel connection, which is not uh, assumed to be. It does not have to be metric, does not have to be torsion free, can be completely general when you will have to introduce two sets of odd generators. Yeah, simply because gamma ij is uh, neither symmetric or anti symmetric, you need to have two sets of odd variables. The rest of the game is uh, as before. So you deform your symplectic structure, you write down the Poisson brackets, 
you find a uh, connection in the p theta Poisson brackets and you find the curvature tensor in the pp uh, Poisson brackets. From this, you can write on general relativity and all kinds of alternative gravity theories, uh, non metric, non torsion, free, etc. If you wonder how you can um, get like a guideline on um, reading of, let's say, these deformations, which deformations to choose, you can take a look at uh, the spinning particle. So with super, with third line supersymmetry, it's a paper by Van Holten. Written down the most general action, which um, has this word line supersymmetry, and from the terms that you have here, you can immediately read off the deformation, plug it into the machine, and we'll give you gravity theory and also coupling to gauge fields. So it looks like word line supersymmetry fixes the action, and uh, how can I say a spinning particle is so demanding on the background that it requires uh, gravitation action that's compatible with Einstein Hilbert action, just like the spin is so demanding. But it also needs that. Right. Anyway, so far this was about point particles. Uh, for strings, we need to double the number of odd variables, just like in the case with the uh, general connection. So instead of this thingy, I didn't completely explain that. So that's the direct sum of cotension bundle shifted to the degree by two, giving you degree two momenta as uh, the coordinates in the fiber. And tension bundle shifted to the degree by one, giving you the odd variables that you can think of one forms. Instead of this, we're going to take the degree two shifted cotension bundle of the degree one shifted tension bundle, so it's larger. And here it is. Uh, manifold has degree zero coordinates locally. The fibers have degree one coordinates for two pairs, and also degree two coordinates, which we call momenta. That's the con canonical symplectic two form in the setting and the canonical um, Poisson brackets. Again, you have canonical transformations here that preserve everything. I'll just focus on the de degree preserving uh, generators of degree two. The things linear in the momenta generate different diffeomorphisms, and the ones which are quadratic in the degree one coordinates generate uh, ODD transformations, just like the example before, where you generate the local Lorentz transformations. Uh, then there's an interesting finite canonical transformations, which is just like exchanging X and P in classical mechanics, but here exchanging the two sets of um, odd variables. You can write down the most general generating function for, for that that you can think of. It involves a symmetric two tensor and an anti symmetric two tensor, think metric and B field. And uh, this map is canonical transformation looks exactly like this. And so you see how the channelized metric comes out of this formalism. It just plays the role of a finite canonical transformation. Okay, how to go from this great setting uh, to channelized geometry? Let me quickly remind you. In ordinary differential geometry, <clears throat> you can understand the deep bracket of vector fields as a derived structure that you um, establish with the help of the exterior derivative in this double bracket. And the same thing can be done in the graded setting. Instead of uh, the exterior derivative, we have a degree three Hamiltonian, a Dirac operator, if you like, featuring momentum degree two, and uh, the odd variables of degree one, and in between the anchor map. It can also be twisted by flux terms like this. And then for the degree one objects, you can get from the Poisson bracket, you can get uh, the natural pairing. From the double Poisson bracket, you can get the anchor map. And from the formula that just looks like the one by Cartan, you get the bracket, which is the Dorfman bracket. To introduce these um, three structures, and then the axioms of a current algebra simply follow from associativity, from graded associativity of a graded geometry. With the three axioms that I've shown you before, and in this computation, I'm just using associativity, and I'm using that. Um, the Dirac operator has zero Poisson bracket with itself. Now we need some more uh, differential geometry in order to formulate gravity theories. Now in the uh, generalized geometry setting, and but we tried very hard to have uh, expressions which are manifestly 
tensorial. And this is what we came up with. Turned out that we need to introduce a further bracket, like a generalized Lie bracket, which is anti-symmetric and has this nice property. If you multiply by a function in the second slot, you can pull it out uh, with the anchor map. So just these two properties you need. And in almost all settings that we have, you have a natural thing like this available. So once you got that, you can um, get a formula for uh, for a connection. You can form get formulas for curvature and torsion, which are fully tensorial. There's this triple identity, which features the uh, Dorfman bracket in the first slot, and this generalized Lie bracket on the right hand side, and the third terms then automatically a connection satisfying all the required generalized connection satisfying all the required uh, properties. Right for notation, maybe that's easier to read here. So you got um, where derivative along v of w contract with u. That's this this thing here. Um, but compared to the other approaches in the literature, there's also this um, a naive curvature and naive torsion tensors, which just use the um, Dorfman bracket over Courant bracket directly. What you get out is non-tensorial, and when people have found terms that can be used to correct it, in particular, Gualtieri has written down a formula with just the uh, Courant bracket here, and then plus some terms that will fix the non-tensoriality. Well, I like it because here this looks like almost ordinary differential geometry. Right now we've got everything that we need to write down um, effective actions and gravity actions. So that's in fact the cookbook recipe. So you pick your favorite graded Poisson structure and deform it using the ingredients that you want, like a metric B field or fluxes and so on. You pick a Hamiltonian and typically you just use the canonical one, or if you like, you can add fluxes here too. Choose a generalized leap bracket, and in all cases that we looked up, there was a canonical choice. Determine the connection by the triple identity that I've just shown you. And then there's one more thing that you need in the end. You need to embed the tension bundle into this uh, double bundle. And from that, you can then extract a connection with tension bundle. But you can compute the Riemann and Ritchie tensors, take uh, trace, write down action terms and action in terms of resulting Ritchie scalar. So it's a complete cookbook recipe. Um, we worked out two examples. So we start with the canonical symplectic two form for graded variables. And we deform just the sector with the graded uh, variables, just this one, we leave the first one alone. You can do that deformation by change of coordinates. Here are two choices that work well. The first one just features a uh, metric and maybe Schwartz, uh, or Kalp, sorry, Kalp Ramont uh, two form B field. And here's one that we looked at more recently that also features a bi vector pi. A little g is uh, the closed string metric and capital G is the open string metric. Use this deformation, put it in the machine, crank the gears, and out you get effective gravity actions and some more nice. Formulas, here's one that I like a lot. A generalized colon formula that works for also non-symmetric metrics. Well, everybody knows we're going for the symmetric metric. Well, here's the expression that you should use if your metric G has an anti-symmetric part in it. Well, it just gives you out the left Shivita connection plus um, the preform H, which is locally DB. Compute the non-symmetric Ritchie tensor from it and you get um, the correct action with a correct coefficient of minus 112 in front of the h squared term. I want to introduce the dilaton. It's kind of a bit tricky in this setting. It turned out that you all you need to do is rescale your, uh, your field binds, crank the machine again, and you get the correct action out. Something strange here, this only works in 10 dimensions, even though this whole thing should not know anything about 10 dimensions. In other dimensions, you get some more chunk. I have no idea why this is like that. Here's a new one, a new approach, new deformation. We base it on the open closed string relations. So the idea is to also write down uh, effective actions that take, take you from the supergravity frame to the uh, non geometric uh, duality uh, frames. The deformation 
of the theta and chi variables uh, with this thing. So you notice g minus b inverse here in terms of the uh, closed string variables and here you can replace it in terms of the open string uh, of variables uh, metric and the bivector pi. The deformed commutation relations of the degree one objects will feature a pairing and it contains the closed string metric and the open string metric, so that works quite nicely. You crank my machine, you put everything in, and that was mostly Eugenia Boffo's work, and you end up uh, with the following proposal for low energy effective action for non geometric closed strings featuring the usual Einstein, uh, the usual Ritchie scalar, and then terms quadratic and the R fluxes terms containing the R flux and the Q fluxes and the open string metric and quadratic and the Qs and again quadratic and the Qs. The R flux and the Q fluxes uh, can, can be locally computed in terms of a bivector by these two formulas. So it's a proposal. There are many other proposals out uh, in the literature by people who are present and some more people. This one is a bit different. So if I want to make some propaganda for, for it, it's uh, symmetric under the analog of the transformation of a B field. There's an analog for the, um, for the bivector, which looks quite complicated, but in the graded geometry setting is actually quite easy to compute. So it has some um, nice invariance properties. How much time I have? Okay, good. So in the last minutes, since I have some more time, it actually concludes my talk more or less. I want to give you two further applications that don't have to do anything with the stuff before, which I uh, find them quite cute. First one is uh, deformed commutation relations in quantum field theory. So instead of introducing some, some gauge fields, deformed the commutation relations. And the second one is using graded geometry uh, to write down mixed symmetry tensor actions. So here's the first one something that we just noticed a short time ago. Take your equal time commutation relations for scalar fields and deform them, replacing the delta function by something that makes the whole thing non-local. Uh, we looked at stuff like this a long time ago, also in the group of Julius West, and we discarded it immediately because you can always get this by just smearing the fields. So it looks completely trivial. So we thought, okay, it's trivial. Don't need to look at it. But we took another look at it and if you don't smear the fields, but have these as local fields, turns out you can go through the whole machinery of QFT, quantization, etc., And you can compute also the, the field commutator away from equal time. And it turns out that that gives you fuzzy light cones. So usually it's supposed, the, the commutator for fields supposed to vanish outside of a light cone. And uh, here's some computations, numerical computations that we have taken here Gaussian. So if that thing is very peaked, you get the usual picture. But if it's not peaked, you get fuzzy light cones. Nice thing is you can still do computations in here. If you go to momentum space, the thing is not so badly deformed. It's just some factors. You can compute the Casimir effect. It turns out to be finite. This automatically regularizes. It's kind of an alternative idea to this uh, non-commutative star product stuffy. OK, the second one an application of graded geometry to mixed symmetry tensors in work done together with Phanasis and, oh, I forgot some more authors here, sorry, Yorgos. <laughs> um, okay, you have mixed symmetry tensors, which uh, here in this case bipartite tensors, anti-symmetric in the J's, anti-symmetric in the I's, but no particular symmetry between them. You can actually formulate them in terms of like an extension of differential forms, like two sets of differential forms, graded variables, with some natural dualities, and natural differentials, and with a very natural way of writing down a generalized Hodge dual. So we have some natural objects here, and um, also very natural way of writing down actions. Um, here's a general kinetic term that you would write down in this theory, looks super simple. And then depending on what you put in here for these mixed symmetry tensors and actually compute it in the components, you get amazing things out. But if you put in the scalar, you just get the Klein-Gordon action. No big deal. Put in a, a vector, you get Maxwell's equation. It was expected, of course, DA, wedge DA, DA, wedge star DA, the usual thing. 
but you can also put in like a one bond tensor and gives you the linearized mm -hmm. Eichner Hilbert action. And the last thing I find quite uh, amazing computation run by Yorgos, where is he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get the bird light action out. I think it's pretty amazing that this thing is, is that thing in that setting. Okay, that brings me to a conclusion. So we focus propaganda. Uh, graded and generalized geometry, I would say, provide a per perfect setting for the formulation of low energy effective actions and uh, theories of gravity. It's a very nice framework. A uh, particular approach that I showed you is based on deformed graded uh, geometry. It's algebraic and almost everything follows just from associativity as a unifying principle. And more traditional approaches to the same topics, which are much older actually, are mostly based on a generalized metric, but you have to do some playing around. All right, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, do we have questions? Anasis? Uh, no, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask about this action that you showed us with uh, with the fluxes. So uh, this this contains some uh, non-tensorial objects, and I was wondering whether I mean apart from I mean, obviously it can hold no local paths, but uh, yeah, can you make it like tensorial? Can it hold like the beyond local patches? Because Q obviously is not a tensor, right? Yes. yes. I reformulate it so that it looks tensorial. Ooh. I think it's the same problem as with the Ricci scalar when you write it out in terms of the Christoffel symbols. It's also non tensorial. I don't think you can do it. That's what you mean, right? I know that probably this, this, like, Okay, from experience from like Poisson Sigma models or things like that, I would expect that this Q should be related to the torsion of uh, of an E connection, of a Lyell's Broad connection. Okay, I see. That's a very good idea. In fact, that's also how you may, can make this thing when you write it out tensorial. Yes. Okay, so I agree it should be something that we should look at or you. Um, it's a question from Niels. Well, nice talk. Um, just a question. So you showed uh, nicely how you can get the effective action of uh, string theory in 10 dimensions in the, in the Schwarz sector. Mm -hmm. You told it all about how you would get uh, the higher form, uh, you know, Ramon Ramon uh, field strength in the game. So yeah, I think it should be also possible in this setting. It has been done by many people using slightly different methods. And I think this can be adjusted. So. I see it as an alternative. So, so you could do it with your formulas. But yeah, ho hopefully it will become simpler, but I'm not sure. Yes, I want to look at it. Okay. Thanks. You want them to have money. Okay. Um, uh, technology just doesn't work for me this round. Oh. Right, my question. So, um, you seem to have this nice uh, machine that work that allows you to introduce metric data if you have a QP manifold. So you focused on degree two, but does this work for higher degree QP manifolds, so positively graded? You probably need that. Um, we didn't look at it yet. I hope so, yes. Oh. Uh, so I cannot answer your question, but I can be hopeful. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. So you, gave, you gave a, a an elegant uh, construction of the, Kurt, the action for the Kurtride field at the end. Yes. Um, does your formalism give any suggestions about 
how you might think about trying to look for interactions for that field, which conventional methods um, seem to fail on. Okay, first of all, I should, am I still online? Okay. First of all, I should say that we should have also cited you here because we were working on your papers, translating them into our language. And um, can I pass this question on to you guys? <laughs> Do we have anything about interactions? Well, we got some funny terms here. It looked, it looked pretty non-local. It would be a different talk, like we can discuss later. Let's look at it later, yeah. It's like with one over a box to power something. Okay, be interested. So the answer is yes. Okay. Maybe I can just ask a very brief question. Um, in your, um, did you look at all at these uh, non-geometric fluxes in the M theory case? Um, I didn't get the first one. Did I look at it? Did you look at the non-geometric fluxes in the M theory case at all? Uh, no, it's it's a similar question. No, we didn't do it yet. Yes. Okay. So just there's a lot of information around, yeah. and f things have been published. So we should just see if we can adjust our formulas into it. Right, because they're the this R fluxes. Uh, mixed symmetry. I know Richard was struggling for a while to get out of something which looks a little bit like this. I'll just yeah. okay. Then, um, if there's no more questions, I think online there are none. Uh, we'll thank Peter again, and we'll move on to the next one. I think probably start introducing Martin. Uh, so we have Martin up next. Uh, he's going to talk about about find out SL five the PDF. Okay, so um, next up we have Martin Cedarwall talking about SL5 supersymmetry. Oh, should be on. That's, that's right. <laughs> um, so it's a paper from July this year. It's a very specific example. It's a funny supersymmetry, and I will talk about it, what, what it gives you in terms of uh, supermultiplets. Essentially, I will probably only talk about one supermultiplet, but there will be interesting um, um, consequences, interesting relations to uh, infinite dimensional superalgebras that I will try to describe to you. Um, some things that I will say comes from collaborations with uh, uh, Jacob Panquist and maybe also Lisa Corbone, and uh, a lot of it also from discussions with 
ongoing work with uh, Saberi. So let's get that. So what I'm essentially doing is <coughs> funny supersymmetry. So we start in five dimensions, but the fermions are not spinners. They are two forms. So why on earth would you do this? And why is it interesting? Well, there are several reasons. Um, one is that this is sort of part of the 10 dimensional supersymmetry. You just reduce a 10 dimensional spinner to uh, five dimensions. You take SO10 to SO5 or S, sorry, SU5 or SL5, and, and this two form will be. Um, an interesting part of the spinner. Actually, it even, um, but never mind. <laughs> there is physics in here because precisely this kind of supersymmetry and the multiplet I will talk about arises as uh, a result of a twisting supersymmetry in 11 dimensional supergravity one possible twisting, the most interesting one probably. I will not talk, uh, describe that to you, that, that would be too complicated, I think. There is connection to uh, um, a specific exceptional superalgebra that I will describe, um, described by Katz and others, so-called exceptional superalgebra. It's infinite dimensional, but it can be realized in terms of vector fields, and it has, uh, been, there has been some attention to, to this superalgebra in, uh, in uh, the mathematics literature. My point of entry is, is rather the superalgebras that uh, arise in uh, exceptional or extended geometry. Um, and I'm, I've been sort of curious why the same or extremely similar structures, the same infinite dimensional superalgebras arise both in supersymmetry and in extended geometry or exceptional geometry. In, a, in extended geometry, um, we know that uh, um, we get this E um, series as duality symmetries when we reduce from 11 dimension supergravity and E4 is SL5 so this is one of one of the series. E5 is, is uh, uh, spin 10 and in order to formulate the um, exceptional geometry or the extended geometry in more gen in, uh, more generally we start from a superalgebra or a tensor, Borchardt superalgebra, or maybe even a tensor hierarchy algebra, which is very similar. That tells us what are our gauge parameters, the whole tensor hierarchy, what are the fields, what are the, etc. So, and we indeed we can formulate the extended geometry as uh, in terms of an uh, L infinity algebra or. B. Batalin Wilkowski formulation um, by getting the L infinity algebra as a derived algebra based on this Lie superalgebra. That's, that's a nice feature. Um, there is a funny uh, correspondence between these uh, Borchett superalgebras and objects in minimal orbits, especially. In this case, um, the, the relevant object is a pure spinner of spin 10. I will tell you what that relation is in a little while. On the other hand, um, when we do supersymmetry, my favorite way of doing supersymmetry is to, using pure spinners inside quotation marks now because it's not a spinner anymore, it's a two form. Um, but if if you want to write down an action for, for D equals 10 super angles, what do you do? Well, you add a pure spinner as, 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 uh, to, your, to your coordinates. You, you, you um, argue that this 
sort of encodes precisely what what the usual superfield formulation does, and then you this enables you even to write down an action for the equals ten super angles, or you can do the same thing for in eleven dimensional supergravity, of course. Uh, I don't know why the mathematics is the same, but uh, this made me curious about uh, thinking about supersymmetry based on other algebras in this series of duality groups. And E4 should be as simpler than E5. That's what, what was what I thought. Uh, so I will not be able to answer this question why the same mathematics appear, but I will be able to use supersymmetry to make some statements about this, these super algebras, which I think is interesting. So here's the super, al super symmetry algebra again. Of course, it's, it's, it's just you do everything as you do with spinners. These can be realized as vector fields, and they commute with, uh, with the covariant derivatives, where you just change the sign, which means you have a superspace torsion, which is the epsilon tensor. So that's sort of the gamma matrix for this choice of representations. So how, how do we do, uh, find super multiplets? I, the way I do it is the following. I introduce a bosonic object in a minimal orbit. This means we have this constraint. This is, looks precisely like the section constraints uh, in, in E4 exceptional geometry. Then I construct this. Remember, this is the covariant derivative, superspace covariant derivative. And just by doing this, when I have this constraint, this projects out the torsion and it goes away. And this, the, then Q squared is zero, and I can consider cohomology. That's the machinery of pure spin and superfield. You can do this for any supersymmetric theory. It's, it always gives you the right answers. It gives you on-shell multiplets when you're when the multiplets are on-shell. It gives you off-shell multiplets when you're off-shell. But even for for the traditionally on-shell theories, you can write an action which which uh, starts with some psi cube psi, which means that you can actions, but Halling-Bilkowski actions will be fine. So let me introduce some notation here. This is the Dinkin label for lambda, and lambda square would be in the symmetric product, but we take away this one, and we just have this one. This, this is, a, of course, a well-known manifold. It's a, I should say uh, it's a Grassmannian, or actually it's a cone, real, real cone of the Grassmannian, or complex. If you, do, you can keep this real in this case. So physical states will arise as cohomology of Q. Then you can sort of ask the question, why does this uh, Q have cohomology? If, if lambda hadn't been constrained, there would be no cohomology, except the trivial one, that was constant cohomology. That would be uninteresting. So it is entirely the properties of, of lambda that, that uh, encodes what is the allowed cohomology. And I, so I'll solve, <laughs> solve the cohomology not by doing this. Of course, I could do that, and this, I will get the same result. Instead, I will show you what is the partition function of lambda. That's sort of a, a backward way of finding the cohomology. It sits in the partition function of lambda. This single constrained bosonic object contains the supermultiplet. This is always true in super multiplets. So let me uh, formally uh, write the field content. I, I expand in powers, positive powers of lambda. So then I will just get a single representation at each power. So P is the power, but I also call it level. So, that's the, so I encode uh, the, the representations at lambda to the power P as in this generating function, which I call the partition function. It's like a Hilbert series. It's an element in uh, uh, polynomials where the coefficients are in, in some um, unit ring of, of representations. So then that's, that's a, si a simple answer. 
I can do some tens of some algebra, just tens multiplying it representations together and see how does this differ from what I would get if if I would compare it to just um, an unconstrained two form. This would be that. I have funny notation here. My, uh, so this one minus T two, ex where the exponent is a representation, that just means the bosonic partition function for an object, symmetric products, and on the, this is for fermions partition function. I always use twisted with fermion number because then, then I can tensor this fermion and boson together and get one. So then I, I will not do the details, but it's, it's very easy to see that the, it, this would be the unconstrained thing, but there is a, it differs from it. And it's a simple polynomial. And in fact, this represents the zero mode cohomology because I think, can think of this factor as compensated or canceled by the partition function of theta. And then I just get a polynomial and that will be my fields independent of X. So that's very useful in itself. I'll show a table later. Then, then I can also factor out the, the first constraint. So this would be the partition function of a, a ghost in the constraint, which is the vector. This would sort of be compensated by X. And what do I, what remains? Then I have to do some algebra. You can, this is, you can do all by hand. It's not complicated. And I get an infinite sum remaining. I get, a, of course, a one, and then I get an infinite sum. This infinite sum organizes in a very nice way. This would be, I can interpret it as I derivatives on a vector. This is a vector and this is the I derivatives. But there is the constraint that I don't have a scalar. So otherwise this wouldn't be irreducible. This one, I derivatives on a two form. So this is this. That's just a serious expansion of in derivative expansion. And this is really, this factor is really the cohomology of, of, of Q. This is the super multiplets. It always works this way. I mean, I, I, this, this is the reason that I get cohomology entirely in, in lambda. So I get a divergence free vector and a closed two form. That's a super multiplet. One of them is fermionic. I can decide which it, this is linearized so far. Had I done the same thing for, for E uh, for a spinner in 10 dimensions, I would have the same thing, but the corresponding super young mills on shell multiplet. Here's a table of which sort of uh, shows you the, uh, oops, can I? Oh, I can't go back. I can't go forward either. Ah, good. Oh. It's alive? Ah, it, ah, I see. Um, I will show you a picture of this um, zero mode cohomology, which really tells me which the fields are. So at lambda to the zero, I have the scalar. I can think of this as a ghost. And here I have the vector and one form. The one form is the potential for the two form we saw here. And here is a, a equation of motion, which is this one it sort of matches. So the ghost number um, assignment is not, is not obvious. You have, this is on a field with the ghost number one, which means that these have ghost number one. This, these have ghost number zero because lambda carries ghost number one and minus one. So that, that would be 
the interpretation. Let me say something about uh, how much time we have. 14. Wow. <laughs> what am I going to do with all this time? That's incredible. Let me say something about uh, something you don't need and something I didn't care about for a long time when I did pure spin and super field theory. Um, this board says uh, that there is a, a duality between the constrained object. I will not go back and forward. On, in, uh, there is a duality, which we, you may call a causal duality, between a constrained constrained object in a minimal orbit, like this lambda, or like the pure spinner in 10 dimensions, and a Lee superalgebra, which in that case is a Borchard's superalgebra. <clears throat> Never mind, I may, I may define it later. It's a very simple uh, superalgebra, uh, super extension of, of, of um, I'll show you exactly what this looks like in this case later. So let me not define Borchard superalgebras in general. Well defined superalgebra from, from a Dinkin diagram. The, the funny relation is that if I take this partition function for lambda, which I just showed you, or more general for any object in a minimal orbit, and tensor it together with the partition function for the positive part of, of, of um, the superalgebra. Actually, I mean, by, by this I mean the content in universal, universal enveloping algebra. So it's really the thing that would appear in a de denominator formula. Then you, it turns out that these are the inverses of each other. That's, that's an interesting statement which we proved like six years ago. Um, so here's the definition of, of this partition function or denominator, if you like. Um, it's, it's a tensor product of, of all the representations at le different levels of this B, take only the positive part and with the appropriate sign to reflect what is really in the universal enveloping algebra. You can understand this relation in, in actually in, um, there is a reason for this. And that, that reason is that suppose we write down um, a BRST operator for the constraint on lambda. It's nothing like the BRST operator I mentioned before, just other thing. So I, I want to write down a BRST operator for the constraint. That oper BRST operator turns out to be exactly the uh, core algebra differential of this superalgebra, which encodes it in its infinite reducibility. In order to, to make that go through, you have, of course, to show that this um, superalgebra does not have any interesting, funny cohomology above the sort of lowest level one, which would be uh, lambdas obeying the constraint. And then if you can show that, then you have proven this relation. So there's a superalgebra lurking behind, which is not just, uh, not just uh, the ordinary global supersymmetry algebra, but, but an infinite uh, dimensional superalgebra. So I, in order to describe that algebra or, what, or it, its content at different levels, I just have to invert. So this is really, what this is, is a useful denominator formula for the superalgebra. Uh, so I have, I take what I had before and this multiplet, the x, uh, theta and x part, the multiplet, and I invert it. Now it happens that this is one minus uh, a series expansion, which is, is uh, 
consistently uh, I have fermions at odd numbers, bosons at even numbers, which immediately means that I can identify this as the uh, part as from level three and up as freely generated by the supermultiplier. Let me not prove that for now. That's a standard statement. If you have this kind of one plus something inverse. If I expand that in powers, again, positive power means fermion, negative power means boson. So the, these are the partition functions of, of fermions and bosons at increasing levels. I see the content of the Borchardt superalgebras, and this coincides exactly with, with uh, the higher ghost fields of, of um, E4 exceptional field theory. But in this case, I get it from supersymmetry. So this is very briefly, this is how we define e, uh, the Borchardt superalgebra. It's just one fermionic node, which means we have a fermionic generator E naught and and F naught and of course an H naught which is bosonic and there is a very simple uh, cell relation that just follows from the definitions which is E naught with itself is zero which is non-trivial since it's fermionic but it it kills the big representation and and keeps the small representation which is um, uh, sort of complementary to the constraint of lambdas. You can also do uh, tensor hierarchy algebras from this diagram, but that, let me not go into that. I, I don't think, I, I think that will take too much time. The interesting thing, let me just say, say it in an example here. I sketch, I give you the beginning of, of the Borchardt superalgebra. And for those of you who have done exceptional field theory, you recognize the, the structure, uh, sequence in the tensor hierarchy and it goes on forever it's of course this is symmetric around level zero but it sort of wants to be symmetric around two two and a half and if i instead instead insist on <laughs> an algebra that is symmetric then, then i arrive at, at something which is called a tensor hierarchy algebra they look the same we think at positive levels. There are small exceptions, but they seem to be the same. Let me tell you what E510 is. E510 is a local supersymmetry algebra. It's, it's um, generated, its parameters is our vector fields. Here I denote them psi, eta, and two forms, chi, psi. And they, of course, the same relation, d dot eta is zero, d psi is zero. Looks exactly like the super multiplet I got, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to check that this is, um, these vector, this vector fields in, in fact generate a super algebra. Of course, this, this I, I write square brackets for everything, this is, uh, this is really an anti-commutator, of course, but uh, if you want to check that, you, you find that it, it is indeed a, a Lie superalgebra because there is a funny identity in, in five dimensions. If, if I have a fermionic gamma and, and do this, I... I I'm uh, oh, sorry, bosonic, bosonic gamma. Uh, this, this is an identity, which you prove quite easily. So this is, there is, there is a number of so-called exceptional uh, superalgebras in this sense that have something to do with uh, superextensions of vector fields that uh, don't go, uh, they have a maximum level, uh, which corresponds to the, global part of the algebra that would be just for for um, 
constant fields, uh, which is a, a global supersymmetry algebra, uh, and there are maybe some more conditions. This is sort of the, what uh, Katz and other people think is the most interesting one. It's, it's, it's sort of very peculiar and, and its existence is, is singular. So E510 is really, the parameters of E510 is really the super multiplet that I got sort of more or less for free. Well, I had to do some algebra and calculation. That is E510. It's the correspondence, it's, it, what, it, it is what corresponds to the, the equals 10 super Young Mills multiplet if I had used that group instead. And indeed, it's, it's part of. of uh, super young males multiple. The funny thing here is that I get an immediate theorem which relates this superalgebra to this superalgebra because I said above level three, it's freely generated by these things. So above level three, the Borgia superalgebra is freely generated by the co-adjoint module of E5, 10. That's an interesting statement, I think, which is a bit surprising to me, but seems to be true. I would have liked to say, say this about the tensor hierarchy algebra, two minutes. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm planning to spend. Um, but we haven't been able to prove that the tensor hierarchy algebra coincides at positive levels. Then I could have said about, if that's true, I could have said about S of E4, that it consists of the freely generated by, by the co-adjoint module. That is exactly half of, of the tensor hierarchy algebra and the mirrored half is just a dual thing. This is, an interesting statement, I think. So if I take this vector, the vector um, in five bar and its derivative, only 24 because it's divergence free and etc. And here's the two form, the fermionic two form and its derivative because it's closed, I, I get this structure. And uh, indeed, this also helped us to, uh, sorry, me in this case, <laughs> to understand um, uh, E510 it, as a sort of tensor hierarchy algebra because that, this gives, I subtract the time it lacks, <laughs> that, that it, um, we, there is a, a strict way of defining E510 in terms of generators and relations, just like we do with the tensor hierarchy algebras. There should be an action for this thing, Chern Simons like, roughly speaking, that derives from the D equals 11 supergravity action. When we insert the actual twistings, we haven't wrote, written it down, but it certainly. Um, consistent due to the psi cube terms encoding the structure constants of E510. There are so a couple of general questions in connection to this, but uh, why one superalgebra or the other? We know that tensor hierarchy algebras are the ones which are really relevant for, for um, extended geometry. Is, is there a difference for supersymmetry? Are they relevant? I don't know. And this is a funny question. Which property of a superalgebra is, is interesting for the existence of, a, of super multiplets? Can I do supersymmetry with E6? Maybe not, but why not? I don't know. I mean, uh, there should be some systematics here, which maybe it's the freely generated property, but and how do you get to that? Well, through supersymmetry. So how uh, there are lots of questions in, in this, the extension of this thing. Okay. 
Thanks a lot, Martin. We have questions. Thanks. So it's a very interesting structure. Um, as you alluded, you could just consider more general all sorts of super algebras where you start off with a Q in some representation and then postulated some, and then you could what if you postulated some tensor to hook the indices together to make an algebra, you could write down a general super algebra. And you and a lot of the um, for, formalism you talked about could extend would extend to in all these more general cases. Um, but uh, one, but the question is, would they all work the same, or would some be more interesting than others? My suspicion is that this one, with its large uh, automorphism group, it's got an SL five automorphism group, which certainly plays a big role in organising the structure yeah. and, and analysing it. Um, whether that's essential or whether you get interesting structure more generally, or is it would it be the case that there wouldn't be interesting representations in a more general case? My feeling is that if you try to start to look, just run the same program for E6, of course I've tried to do this a bit. It looks very complicated. I think, I think some, something uh, is not, doesn't work as good as it does for, for the lower ones, but uh, I can't tell you what it is yet. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? No, that probably means people are very hungry. So we'll thank Martin again. And uh, maybe just quickly to those of you who um, might have watched online this morning, um, there was an announcement regarding tomorrow's trip. Uh, if you want to come, please sign up. It, we leave on the boat at 1.30 from the Oak Port, which means there is a bus leaving from outside Monroe Port at 1.15, and we have to be very punctual tomorrow. Okay.